Welcome to the 63rd episode of Chatting with Nuts. I should have I should have started out with Hello Booktube. That's what I should have started out with because uh, my guest tonight is uh, someone who's been on Booktube for a long time, but is also a professional critic, book critic, which is uh, the first time I've ever had a professional critic on the show ever. So this should be interesting seeing as I'm a complete amateur, but that guest is Steve Donahue. Steve, how are you doing tonight? I'm fine. Hello, Booktube. <laughs> I'm just fine. How are you, Jimmy? I am. Uh, I'm doing well. Um, I'm excited for the weekend. You know, it's Friday the 13th. So everyone happy Friday the 13th. Uh, who knows? I'm surprised that everything's gone smoothly at this point. I'm hoping like my internet doesn't shut down. My camera might overheat, though. That's something I've been dealing with lately. So if that happens, no one panic. I'll be back. Um, but yeah, I'm good, man. I uh, I feel like it's finally kind of spooky season. You know, we always talk about spooky season on BookTube. Everyone reads a horror book and does the whole the whole thing. I kind of read some more horror uh, adjacent stuff last month, but I don't know. I, I feel pretty good, which is nice. And I don't have as much staff infection on my face now, so I don't feel as bad getting in front of the camera, uh, you know, with sores all over my face, but yeah, I'm good. That was a long way to say I'm good. <laughs> my face comes this way, so there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> and, and for me, spooky season is a lot more about reading horrible books than horror books. <laughs> So, reading you do you enjoy reading horrible books oh yeah i don't enjoy reading horrible books but i enjoy what follows <laughs> which would be eviscerating them on an operating table with no anesthesia <laughs> now i just watched a video of yours where you were talking about the philosophy of your reviews and you were talking about um being not attacking the author do you ever feel like the author might take it as an attack if you eviscerate their work? Occasionally, if an author writes a truly steaming pile of dino crap, I will close. I will come close to the line. I will say something to, that I know is designed to infuriate them, merely because I need an outlet for the outrage of, of my outrage that they let this piece of crap out into the world. Like, for instance, if a book is really, really, really awful, I will look up the author. I will ascertain that they were born in Pennsylvania. And in my review, I will say a little leeway must be given because clearly English is not the author's first language. <laughs> I know that they're going to get beat red furious over that, but they deserve it. <laughs> they absolutely deserve it. <laughs> but that's as close as I get. I don't ever, I don't ever, I don't get any closer than that. Usually. It's very provocative of you. I, I, uh... <laughs> That is uh, that, that is one way to go about it. I, I can't say I've ever done that. Uh, what, what, what's your uh, gripe against Pennsylvania? What was that again? What's your gripe against Pennsylvania? None. Not at all. <laughs> they no, just happen to always be from Pennsylvania. The gimmick would be that I, I, uh, I say that about an author that I know English is their first language. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting them to try to protest. That's all. <laughs> or I will read some horrible, horrible piece of wet wash science fiction and and i will refer to it all throughout my review as a ham-handed allegory when i know the author doesn't think it's that they don't have the wit to think that it's that but just i will i will intentionally do that because that's a way to read their book <laughs> this isn't awkward i'm usually cuddly i want i want to give off a cuddly air for my debut on the fantasy network <laughs> yeah i mean this is this is, you finally made it to the stage man you know you I did i have finally penetrated gondolin <laughs> Gone to, beautiful. So does Very. that make me Meglin? Does that make me a sexy dark elf? Maybe some dark hair across one eye? Uh, kind of edgy. I, I mean, I could see it. I could see it. <laughs> I just worry that a lot of my own viewers will come here. I, I worry that if I'm Meglin, I'm coming with a whole bunch of my own little Balrogs. <laughs> I hope can Balrog not. Balrog be little? I don't know if a Balrog can be little. Well, let's check the chat. And see. <laughs> they said emo Steve leaning because <laughs> oh, every edgy character leans. Yeah, if if you're an edgy character, you have to lean against the no, wall. Do I really? Yes, no. uh, that was that was uh, dubbed the cliche by my good friend Alan. Um, he he pointed out that it, in fact, in a lot of media, the edgy person does lean against the wall. <laughs> Once you reach age 280, leaning is not advised because <laughs> <laughs> then it quickly it turns into falling. Yes, it quickly turns into slipping and falling and then complaining. 
and Joanna is considered the dark elf in this part of booktube so you have allies in the fantasy realm of booktube at long last mm. how does it feel it feels good it feels good although if memory serves from previous episodes of the fantasy network i'm kind of daniel and lion's den you think you like stephen king you okay. like Philip K. dick you like Cormac McCarthy. <laughs> well, well let's just jump yeah. into it, Steve. Why don't we? Um, you know what? Before all those, there's a book that I, I, I'm I not sure if you dislike, but I wanted to know if you disliked. And that is Stoner by John Williams. Yes, I dislike it. Very much so. And you okay. know what else? What? You yeah. do too. You think so? I know so. You do too. The only reason you have a twinge in your lower lumbar region when you talk about it is because that's the strain of moving the goalposts. That's what you do with stoner. And then you move them right back <laughs> to talk about something else. Okay. So so can you... Yeah, stoner? I hate it. I absolutely hate it. So why do you I, hate stoner so much? Well, not because of its surface execution because the author was talented. It's not because of the surface execution. It's because of all, it's because of fair reasons and unfair reasons. The fair reasons are that it's, it's Fight Club, which you probably also love. <laughs> it's, it's, it's Fight Club. It's, it's the only reason that every man isn't Alexander the Great is because of women. And the reason that isn't fair is because of the rapturous dude bro reception that it's received in the last 20 years. It flew completely under the radar until this generation of dude bros finally, you know, achieved puberty <laughs> and, and, and immediately took on a voice that's two octaves lower and a nice blankety thick persecution complex. <laughs> Interesting. So what, what about the females who enjoy the book? I don't believe there are any. There, I know them. I know some who very much enjoy Stoner uh, and all John Williams' other works as well. Do you feel this way about all of his other works as well, like no. Augustus? Okay. No, not any of his other works. Just this. Okay. Just this. And the sticking point is really the fact that you feel like it's the story of the woman holding him back from achieving his goals. Yes. Yeah, it's Fight Club. It's it's women are nihilistic vampires, and they're not. <laughs> I think I think we can agree. <laughs> that they're not. <laughs> well, Steve, how about Augustus and Butcher's Crossing then? Well, I think you said you don't mind them, right? No, no, not at all. I mean, Williams is overrated. Just in general, he's overrated. But he's mostly overrated because of Stoner. Take that out of the mix, and he would be just another mid-20th century mid-list author. But, you know, there are plenty. Of them, and they're they're all fairly technically talented. See, see, what I, I mean? see what I mean? I'm in the lion's den, aren't well, I? Well, no, no, this is good. Because no, here, the here's the thing. So here's and the we thing. We haven't even touched on your inexcusable lukewarm neutrality towards the rings of power when you right. should be viciously hateful of it. <laughs> I, just, I Well, we can get to that for sure. But um, I, I, think, I think you're going to be very disappointed. Um, and I hope you don't leave the stream when you hear this. But I am 100% responsible for like a decent amount of people checking out Stoner. So I am the dude bro in which you hate, I think. Your dude bro patient zero? Is that I it? might be dude bro patient zero. I So what I found from the book that, that resonated with me, one, um, I think it's fairly pessimistic, which I would consider myself to be a bit of a pessimist. But uh, I really enjoyed uh, the portions of the book where he was leaving home. And he was deciding that he was going to take a different path of his life than what his parents had set out for him and what the generations of them had done. And there's something about that is just like really complicated in, in that family dynamic that just like touched me. And I thought, I don't know, I really latched on to that. Um, there's certainly an argument to be made that his wife is not painted in a very good light. But in a recent discussion, um, I, there was a lot more subtlety to that character than I realized. Um, you, you don't you don't buy it no I don't <laughs> I don't buy it in the slightest and usually when people usually when people 
stay. You know, I, I went back to it, man. You didn't say man, but it was implied. It was heavily implied. I mean, usually when people say, you know, I went back to it, man. There's a lot more subtlety there than I thought. I always want to say to them, okay, well, you told me that 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, I asked you if you've ever read John Dos Passos or Thomas Wolfe, and you said no. 10 years have passed. I bet if I ask you that question, you'll still say no. But when I ask you how many times you've reread Stoner, the number will be pretty high. This is, this is just another example of the people who will line up around the block to call, for instance, Haruki Murakami a great Japanese stylist. I asked them 10 years ago, have you ever read any great Japanese stylist? And they say no. I asked them 10 years later, and they say, oh, no, I still haven't got around to it. <laughs> this is turning out more contentious. Than <laughs> no, this is kind of what I expected, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> this is kind of what I was going for. Um, so, so I hear you. The banner is flashing along the bottom. Steve's one and only appearance. <laughs> on the Catch it now before it's gone. Um, will not be available after the fact. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, no, no, no. I think it's good to hear a dissenting opinion because everyone I have on has enjoyed Stoner. And uh, that ranges from many episodes ago, honestly. So hearing someone who does it, you know, the echo chamber is only fun for a little bit. Uh, I like hearing other things. Now, the one thing yes, I, I will push back on. They didn't. They no, didn't. See, that's not that. They that's didn't. not fair, Steve. Listen to their voice. Watch their body language when they talk about something they did enjoy. Is it the same? No. It's not anywhere close. Ooh. Oh, they're different things, man. No. <laughs> no, enjoyment is one and one thing only. So you can <laughs> only enjoy something one way. You can... <laughs> Your body language, your voice, your mannerisms, your affect, when you talk about a book you genuinely love, is never the same. People, when they say they love Stoner, it's never the same as when they say they love something that, I guess, doesn't get them any dude bro credit. I mean, what would be an example? Everybody has an example. Everybody has an example when they're not moving the goalposts. And then they shoulder down, they, they lift with their knees, and they move the goalposts for Stoner or Cormac McCarthy. And then they move them back. <laughs> but it, why would you need to do that unless where's you're making the, where, where's the goalpost going i don't know i honestly don't know i think that's an important question it is an important question i don't i don't know why people do that except that i think it's a kind of matryoshka doll thing i think they get the sense i think the readers who claim they love stoner get the sense that they should do that from other people who have also got the sense that they should claim they love stoner well, all the while, when you catch them in private, when those other Matryoshka doll stoner people are not around, they're drastically, enthusiastically loving something that doesn't have any dude bro credit at all. But what about someone like me who came to it in a complete random happenstance? Like, had no idea its, like, its reputation. I thought it was about weed. Swear to you. I really did. I had no did idea. I do. I didn't have any idea what it was about. And then I read it and I was like, this is this is moving me very much. And then I talked about it with enthusiasm. So do you, don't you feel like generalizing into a dude road category only is unfair? Somehow it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know quite how. Give me a little time and I'll figure it out. But somehow it's not. <laughs> and, and you know, I mean, that's wonderful. And I dutifully, I am glad that you enjoy it. But I raise a skeptical eyebrow. Okay. Because you're, you know, the little jungle boy, your little Mowgli who crawls out of the brush, and the first thing his innocent fingers touch is Stoner, and he knows nothing at all about it. That would be far more convincing to me if that were the first time I'd heard that Stoner story. But it isn't. And how many Mowglies can there be? How many people can just be crawling out of the woodwork and encountering this thing on the sidewalk? <laughs> just so possible that you were prepared for it without knowing it. How, how would you figure? Well, was it the first book you read? Or did you have perhaps perhaps you were infected by teachers? 
might have made a random mention of it. Got lodged back in the main. No, 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 no. Huh, not my school. My school system just got rid of all their libraries. <laughs> so trust me, there was no emphasis on reading where oh. I went to school. <laughs> okay, so you're a stoner native. I am a stoner native. <sighs> I, I am genuinely an enjoyer. And Joanna, who is not a dude bro, uh, also loves Stoner. And I would say she was very enthusiastic. She did a, a video about Augustus and Stoner. I think it was Augustus. Maybe it was Butcher's Crossing. Um, but it was very enthusiastic. I, I mean, I'm not denying um, that there are people out there that have the experience that you're talking about. But I also think it's fair to say that there are people who probably pick it up and do in, enjoy it and really do enjoy it without moving the goalpost. Hmm. I started with Stoner because I think this will be the easiest one for me to defend because, like, I consider it one of my favorite books of all time. Well, he is fairly easy to defend in one level. He is talented in a way that you won't find in the 21st century. He's, he's a, he actually understands how to use the English language. <laughs> Which a good deal of the writers you are going to talk about, I suspect, do not. Uh, but he does. So you, you can at least say that. Mm-hmm. I just, I can't shake the suspicion with you or Joanna or anybody else. I can't shake the suspicion that if I flung open the closet door and flashed in a flashlight, you'd all be reading Twilight. I'm loving it. <laughs> wait, so wait, wait, you're saying Stoner and Twilight are kind of one and the same? No, I'm saying that I bet, well, I, I can't, I can't speak for you because you're apparently a Stoner native, but I bet that the things that the people who champion that book go to, the things they go to in private, unprompted, for real enjoyment, are not stoner. I, I'd be willing to bet that in almost all cases. I have almost never known it to be true that a fan of that book was not moving the goalposts. Hmm. Well, now you've met one. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we might as well move on to another uh, book that I enjoy, and Jared brought it up, is the uh, Blood Marine. So why do you hate Cormac McCarthy? <laughs> Let's just knock them all down, Steve. Let's just get Jared Anderson. <laughs> I hate Cormac McCarthy because he stinks. He's really, really, like, is really he... bad at, oh. on almost every level of what he does. In fact, every level. All of his imagery is inconsistent. He has no characters. He has no women. He doesn't understand what women are. I thought it was absolutely hilarious. The publicity tour they did it for his last two piles of crap where he actually told an interviewer. He didn't seem to have any self-awareness at all. He, he actually told an interviewer, basically, you know, all this time I've been writing these novels on a red checker tablecloth on a yellow legal pad with no punctuation and no editing. And this whole time I've been kind of wondering, what would a book be like if a woman were a person? I figured I'm not getting any younger. I might as well try it. <laughs> and the interview is just worshipfully nodding. <laughs> Instead of saying, yes, that's what made you a one-dimensional fraud all this time. The interview didn't say that. <laughs> and now no one gets a chance to say that. So what do you think the uh, allure is to his works for people? Oh, don't tell me. Let me guess. You crawled off the bassinet, fell onto the shag carpet, and there was a copy of Blood Meridian right there. You're a Blood Meridian native as well. No, oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm genuinely asking, like, what do you think the allure is? Because people do seem to, to, to enjoy it. I would like to hear, like, can, what, what is your cipher on that? My cipher on that is that it's video games. It doesn't take any work like reading does. It's video games. And... Every one of your listeners will be able to know that by comparing what their brain felt like when they were in the middle of the second book of the Malazan Book of the Fallen, compared to, at any point, in any Cormac McCarthy novel. Now, you're going to say, well, the Cormac McCarthy novels mostly all stand alone, and they're, you know, they're not world-building, they're not epic fantasy, it's a different genre, but I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying your brain feels different when you're reading those two things. Because one is laying out all of the proper work of storytelling. It's engaging it literally a different part of your brain than the part that loves to zone out in front of a video game. And Cormac McCarthy is not doing any of that. He is engaging a different part of the brain. He's engaging a part of the brain that just wants the rat at the pleasure button. And that's all. Just give me more of that. Just give me more of that. I don't want any texture. I don't want any narrative. I just want more of that. Just give me more of that. 
Do you think video games are all very passive? I think video games rely on it. Let's just diplomatically say it this way. I think video games rely on a different set of rewards than books do. Hmm. Okay. I mean, I I, I think I could see a, a way to that for sure. Uh, and really, the video game thing is a, a null point. So you feel as if it's... I've never met a, a reader who said to me in a conversation, you know, I meant to play uh, World of Warcraft last night and i just was reading instead i've never met a reader who said that i've met countless readers hmm. who say you know i meant to read last night <laughs> but i played world of warcraft until three in the morning anyway instead and i didn't do that did you ever play world of warcraft no why not no, why not because it was reading time that's why <laughs> there's a lot of reading in world of warcraft you got to read a lot of those menus you got to figure out those spells steve i think you would have been a wonderful warlock <laughs> oh my oh my talk about warlocks oh i had a feeling today this afternoon oh my god i'm still tingling with it and you haven't felt it but you will i firmly believe you will about writing i mm. i've been prepping for NaNoWriMo and i've been just casting around one idea after another one genre after another Ooh, this would be interesting well, maybe that would be interesting. Oh, well, that I could probably make something out of that. And I don't think I was explicitly waiting for that. See, you, this is the part you're, that you're not gonna you're not gonna get yet. But there's there's a particular feeling. Jared Henderson, for instance, just recently felt it. He knows what it feels like. Every writer out there knows what it feels like. That moment when suddenly a lightning bolt bursts inside you. You're no longer casting around for. I could do something with this, or I might be able to work that up into something, but rather you are, I want to put off food and water to write this thing. It's, mm -hmm. This it is an obsession. Yeah, yeah. It's, and yeah, I finally felt that, that this morning, and it's a fantasy story. <laughs> so so I'm, I'm working even close. Granted, I'm doing damage to my entrance into, into Gondolin with this horrible, contentious stream. <laughs> are you just trying to impress me, or...? No, 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 that's just it. I'm, I am, I hope, recovering a little cred because it is a fantasy story. And oh my God. Oh my God. You, you, when you're prepping for NaNoWriMo, you know you're doing it right when suddenly it's hard to wait to write. Mm. You're not allowed to write until November and it is really hard to wait. Now. I've had a few friends that are kind of in that same boat. Like they got their prep done early and they're like, I just want to write this opening yeah. paragraph. And it's like, well, go for it, do it, you know? And uh, when I talked to Steven Erickson, he mentioned that, that almost like feeling of like, it's over pouring out of you. Like there, you will not feel, you can't even go to sleep until you start writing. Right. Yeah. Right. And you, you, uh, I, I cannot describe that feeling, but it is absolutely incredible. That's why I always tell people who haven't tried writing yet, especially protracted writing, a long work of creation. It's what I always try to tell them is that this, you're thinking of it as work because you're looking at a word count. But the, the payoff, the feelings that are involved are unbelievable. They don't come from anything else in life. Not quite the same as anything else. And I finally felt that today. I am no longer casting around. I finally felt that just That's today. Awesome. That's awesome. Mm. Cannot you've been, wait. You've been very encouraging about NaNoWriMo on your channel. And, and uh, you, you mentioned something whenever I was in your chat and you said that you feel like uh, that, that as a reader, you have a responsibility to, to write. Can you can you talk about that a little bit? You do indeed. Yeah. Think about, well, think about tiny little Jimmy with his, with his chubby little baby fingers touching Stoner for the first time and how wonderful it felt. Imagine if he hadn't written it. Hmm, yeah. Hmm. There were, if your if your stoner origin story is correct, and we will assume that it is, then there were six books on one side of it and six books on the other side of it that did nothing. You experience that today. You experience that now. You'll be hmm. reading. You'll read six books on one side, six books on the other. But in the middle, there's one that takes over the whole world. If the writer hadn't written that, it wouldn't have been there for you to feel that about it. And you are that voice for someone else. That someone may be just born. That someone may not be born for centuries or millennia. 
you are that voice for somebody. Everybody is that voice for somebody. If you don't do it, if you don't get it out of yourself and into the world, which has never been easier, it has never been easier to do that, then when that person down the line goes to the central data bank on Vulcan or whatever and looks for it, they won't know what they're looking for, but they'll know they're not finding it. They'll hmm. know that they're only making do with something else because you didn't do it. <laughs> so it, is, it is the absolute incumbent obligation of every person to put their voices out into the stream, especially now that it's so easy. For God's hmm. sake, it's never been easier. But what if you uh, try really hard and then you produce something that is subpar and then you see Steve eviscerating it? <laughs> well, do you think someone's going to say, gee, I'm glad I joined the stream? <laughs> yeah, they are. If they get if they get a secular church built to them like Cormac McCarthy for writing a gigantic... <laughs> He wrote a gigantic uh, terminal uh, pile Steve, of Steve, all the churches are torn down in all the Cormac McCarthy books I've ever read. They're in rubble. Yes, they are. They're bare ruined choirs in which the laughter of the cosmos echoes hollowly. Yeah, that's that's actually fair. Yeah. Except you, you didn't yeah, go long what, enough. But that's what the eleven year old says who has no book learning. That's the lie that's not uh, what the narrator says about the eleven year old. That's what, how the eleven year old talks. They're bare ruined choirs. And do any of the other characters say, what the hell are you talking about? No, they don't. Because they're all talking that way, too. <laughs> I am yeah. very... What do you think of, like, the critics who... Because, obviously, you're a professional critic. Like, what do you think of, like, Harold Bloom, who, like, touts it as, you know, the best American novel, possibly? I have been dealing with this quote from that person since he said it. And he said it a few times in private before he put it on paper. It's entirely possible, unconfirmed, but entirely possible that one of the times he said it in private was over wine and calzones, <laughs> where, where beagles were annoying his shins. I have had to give the same repost every single time. It's just going to be a, this is going to be a scorched earth. I'm glad to I'm glad to add into the <laughs> the array. My repost is the same. He never read it. He never read it. He saw a bunch of young dude bros and he wanted to feel like he wasn't old. That's all. That's all. How do you know that, Steve? Well, you just leave to me how I know that. But I know that. He never read it. And even if he had read it, he would be guilty of moving the goalposts. What is, what is the... I've had to deal with his assessment of that book forever. No one ever brings it up without the first words out of their mouth being Harold Bloom. Well, he was. I always want to say, okay, well, you, you've got memorized his one comment on Blood Meridian. Have you checked out any of the other hundred books he mentions in the book that you're talking about? No, you haven't. But with that line, you know. <laughs> so, what is gained by earning a uh, credential with Dude Bros? Like, what is the because it seems like a lot of people want the Dude Bro credentials. What what is the payoff? I don't I don't really know. It could be that we have too many generations where too many men skipped out on compulsory military service. I, I don't maybe that's the reason. I, I don't really know. I know I know that I, I have most often seen dude bro worship in people who've never taken a punch to the face, never delivered a punch to the face, never had faced a, a gun directly pointed at them, never had to fight with a stranger to protect someone they love physically. Most of the time, the people who are singing the praise of this crap the highest are people who have not had any of the experiences that it is fetishizing. Well, could I will say hit? more people could probably get be served by getting hit in the face. I, I don't actually think it's necessary. <laughs> I bet you have one particular person in mind right about now, don't you? You know, just someone hanging out in Boston <laughs> and just talking all kinds of trash oh no, oh, no. no all the regular guy. viewers of the fantasy network are tuned in for the friendly conversation they're going what's going on here I don't the funny thing is you're on the fantasy network you wanted to become you wanted to gain entry to gondor and we haven't even talked about fantasy yet steve <laughs> no no we haven't talked about fantasy no we haven't talked about your lukewarm at refusal to condemn the rings of power so i mean here's the thing steve here's the thing can you really expect me to like good literature whenever I'm just a lowly fantasy reader? 
you're trying to get me going, aren't you? You're know that one, yes. Yes, in face. fact, I was. I but was you're trying face. to get me going. <laughs> you're trying to make me alienate myself from the rest of Gondolin. <laughs> You know, I thought I said I'll humanize him first, but I just decided forget it. <laughs> so let's just lay the traps. It's been right. impossible to do that. It's a real uphill climb. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't. I can't keep going flamethrower. Or Philip Chase will never like me. <laughs> Philip Chase, Chase doesn't like anybody. No, no, no. He seems to be the the besetting nemesis of the he's, fantasy. <laughs> he's so mean. He's just he's so 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 mean. Um, what's your problem with Rings of Power? You didn't like it. What was your original question? You you asked a flamethrower question before that. What was it? Oh, just how could a, you expect me to pick out good literature whenever I'm just a lowly fantasy reader? Right. Well, I I know that was just meant to get my goat, but allow me to uh, to stress there is no such thing as a hierarchy of creative of creative endeavors. None. Okay. I like I like yeah. where you're going. That does not exist. There is no such thing as a hierarchy of creative endeavors. That means history is not higher than pulp. That means marble sculpture is not higher than jazz. That means there is no hierarchy. That hierarchy does not exist. It's one of the foremost cudgels that snobs use, but it doesn't exist. It's not real. It's all about execution. That's the level playing field is just execution. It doesn't matter what you're doing. It matters how well you're doing. So there's no such thing as a lowly fantasy reader. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I obviously agree with you. Um... You know, I've even heard people comment about, you know, children's books that were written very, very well. And they're amazing books because of that. And, uh, you know, you don't really think about that when you think of like great books. You know, most of us yep. aren't going to go, oh, yeah, there's a this book that was published 40 years ago for children, but they exist. No, this the children's books would be a really, a really good, really easy yardstick of what I'm talking about. They are. They absolutely demonstrate what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all about execution. If you're, it, it, it's apples and oranges to compare, you know, the aesthetic results of anything, but there's no such thing as saying that a kid's book is by its definition less somehow than an 800 page biography. Hmm. That's that, that is totally false. You hear that all the time. And when you don't hear it, you often hear it implied. And I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I have read many, many, many works of Russian history that are not nearly as well executed as the Velveteen Rabbit. So <laughs> it's a, I guess maybe it's a critic way of looking at things because it is all about assessing the work, not about, oh, well, you know, if it's, if it's a translation of Tolstoy that I'm in some sort of high church performance. No, no. Oh, no. you hate Tolstoy too? No, I love him. But oh. what I'm saying is that, you know, people would say, well, you're, so you're a translator, huh? And you'd say, yes. And then they'd say, what do you translate? And if you say, I translate, uh, I don't know, Dragon Ball Z, you're going to get a different reaction than if you say, I translate Tolstoy. And that reaction is fraudulent. That do reaction like only Ball comes Z? from... What was that? Do you like Dragon Ball Z? No. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it is why, you know, you see what I'm saying. People yes. would automatically assess those as radically different things. They aren't. It all... The question should be not, oh, do you hope someday to translate Tolstoy? Instead, the question should be, are you good at translating Dragon Ball Z? Yeah. What kind of a job do you do at that? Mm -hmm. But that was that was. I just wanted to, I just wanted to get that out there. Yeah, that's, that's good. I think I we have an agreement, Steve. I think we finally have agreed on something. Very rare agreement, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> which would... we're not going to share with Rings of Power. Is that right? We're not oh no, I just don't. Care. Here's the problem. I don't care about Rings of Power. That's oh, the okay, good. I, oh, great. I, uh, the, For some the reason, reason I had the impression that you kind of liked. Uh, no, I just don't care about it. So here's the weird thing for me. Um, I don't care that much about adaptations except for a very select few and even when i'm enjoying adaptations i always seem to just fall off with them because i'd rather read and that's just how it goes now like i struggle very much to to finish shows and uh it kind of sucks because like i do like being part of the discourse like i've been watching uh, a lot of videos about the wheel of time season two and i love some of the breakdowns i see and they're differing oh, yeah. opinions some people like some of it some people hate some of it and some people aren't book watchers some are book readers of the book series and some are and it's just like Part of me wishes I was a part of that conversation, but I the just breakdowns can't. are amazing. Some yeah. of the book sage does an incredible breakdown of I every episode. And a bunch of other people too. They, some of the, the breakdowns are absolutely amazing. But eight uh, hours of t TV is tough for me now. Yeah. 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 
but there, I mean, there's a certain kind of thrill in seeing something that you loved on the page. Certainly. Translated yeah. perfectly. Yes. You know, on the screen that, that I think is what keeps people coming back is waiting for that moment. It's undeniable. So, yeah. I would agree with that. I mean, um, I love the Lord of the Rings trilogy, like clearly, um, you know, in to have that experience again with something that I love that I've read. I mean, that would be amazing. I would love that. Yeah. Um, yeah well, of course, the Lord of the Rings is the thing that comes up, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is the ride of the Rohirrim. Yeah. And, it, you know, if you hadn't stuck it out, you wouldn't get to that sequence. You wouldn't, you know, if you, if you just thought, well, fellowship, and then I'm going to tap out, you wouldn't have got to that sequence mm -hmm. and other things too. I mean, they're, they're adaptations that really work well. The Rings of Power is not an adaptation, of course. It's, it's nothing. It's nothing yeah. at all. It's, not it's, even like, fan it's one page of uh, the Silmarillion, I believe, right? Isn't it? Or the back notes? It's the appendices. Appendices. It's a page of the appendices. No, it's all of the appendices. Uh, really? It's the, appendices, it's the appendices of the Lord of the Rings. And a couple of sections of... And the, the if you go by just the appendices of the Lord of the Rings, just those 60 close type pages, you have amazing fodder for great stories amazing when i heard that this was happening and that what's his name was going to spend a billion dollars on this i thought well okay so he's had an army of tolkien's people going through those appendices to, to winnow out the best stories at some point some lieutenant of his some his sith partner or whatever must have gone to a development meeting in hollywood and said we've got a billion dollars on the table I'd like you to go through the material that we have the rights to and tell me, give me the five best stories and sell them to me so that I can pick the one I like the most. I'm sure that that happened. That had to have happened. Tom Shippey probably did that or at least advised it. it because there are stories. I, I angrily reread that. The, the stuff that he writes to you, I angrily it's a vengeance. after I watched The Rings of Power. And all like I just kept underlining things, saying you could have done that, or you could have done that, but no. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say this: I watched the whenever the first three episodes dropped, I watched those, and then I never watched any more. Um, I will say this: whenever the first episode came on, I had this feeling of like, oh my god, I'm back in Middle Earth. I was like, oh my god, this is you know, like this is happening kind of deal. And then after that, I never really felt that that middle earth kind of magic again, you know? Yeah. I didn't notice any magic at any point in the show. In fact, it's one of the rare instances where a show that I virulently hated, my hatred has only grown as I've thought about it. As I've reflected back on it, my hatred has only grown for every, literally every single detail of the show. Every single thing you could mention was bad intentionally bad arrogantly bad the showrunner saying i know better than tolkien i know better than you fans you're all crypto fascists anyway one of them actually said that on social media and was not immediately fired by the money people at, at the studio <sighs> bad pr move i would say so do, do you feel like fidelity to the source material is very important for you for an adaptation work well no no because think about think about uh the helm's deep sequence in the two towers yeah, that's yeah, not absolutely. that that, that deviates quite a bit and it's pure magic <laughs> it's yeah. perfect when when people who falsely defended rings of power said oh well, you know tolkien fans they just want exactly what's on the page any tolkien fan in the world could go to them and say no <laughs> no oh, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's not a person in the world who doesn't love that sequence and it's not what's on the page it's a question of are you capturing the spirit of what's going on are you capturing the wonder the excitement of it but the thing about Rings of Power is that Tolkien left us a blueprint of how to do it. A reverse engineered blueprint of how to take those appendices and add in all sorts of personal drama. And you know how he did that? Because in the in the Silmarillion, he gives us a chapter called Of the Rings of Power in the Third Age, where he takes the Lord of the Rings and takes the personal drama out. <laughs> he removes the personal drama from hmm. the story that we've just read. I see. So you could reverse engineer that chapter to add that in to the stories that we get in this in the Silmarillion. I, we don't we don't hear anything about Eowyn fighting the Witch King in of the Rings of Power in the Third Age. We don't know Frodo's name. We don't know that he went to Mordor with someone. We don't know anything like that. We don't never hear about Legolas and Gimli and the friendship that they develop. 
never never the doubts or the growth into into personhood of Aragorn. All that is missing from Of the Rings of Power and the Third Age. It captures the essential elemental epic nature of the drama, but it removes all of that stuff. Well, for the appendices, you could add that back in if you had Tolkien fans doing it. But no. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it seems like uh, uh, from what I've heard, because um, I, I, I do talk a little bit at, about adaptations in one of the podcasts that I'm a part of, and we kind of look at you know, trends and what people are saying. And it seems like Rings of Power uh, internally uh, was not a success. Like they're aware that that it was not a success. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens. But I think they signed that for four or five seasons. Like yeah, five pretty, seasons. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much guaranteed. The so the story that they went with the the elevator pitched story. I'm sure those those Tolkien nerds gave, you know, Darth Sidious five stories. Here are five stories that you could spend your billion dollars on. And I'm sure that the decision was made at the studio level that the story that we pick has to connect with Lord of the Rings, the movies by Peter Jackson. It has yeah. to connect with that somehow. So it can't be about the Silmarils. And so they chose the forging of the Rings of Power and the fall of Numenor. That is a great story. That is a great choice. And there is no way for Amazon the Rings of Power to recover from its first season. The only way it can be saved is to forget the first season of Star Wars because literally nothing salvageable in the first season. Nothing at all. Every little detail. It, it... Oh, yeah. Sorry. Well, no. <laughs> um, I, the one thing that kind of stuck out to me was the fact that Numenor was this big deal, right? And and I think people were maybe, to me, that was the most compelling thing. It's like, okay, you're going to see Numenor. Okay, well, that's going to be pretty sweet. And then it uh, was very disappointing in fact i would say that it looked more plain than some of the stuff we saw in the original trilogy of movies which doesn't make sense uh no, based on the lore sense. at all so um doesn't i make think sense at all. yeah i think we get, that, we get five establishing stop shots of numenor from a great distance none of them are anywhere near as good as the one establishing shot we get of rivendell in the fellowship of the ring yeah. but we get five establishing shots and then what are the interiors i think one of them was filmed in this room uh, you can see boom mic shadows. <laughs> there, there are echoes off poor fa uh, false matting that you're going to put the green screen on. <laughs> Utterly ridiculous. Utter <laughs> I asked a question at the time, after like episode two or three. My foremost question is, where on earth is the investigation of where this money went? It isn't on the screen. And the Tolkien estate has been up front in how much they asked for the adaption rights. There's a huge gap between that and what I'm seeing. Yeah, hundreds of millions of dollars. Dollar. Yeah. Where did it go? Where did that money go? It's a it's a good question. I mean, I think we get a little bit starry eyed when we see budgets for shows nowadays. But I just watched a very low budget sci fi uh, movie that no one will save you on Hulu, um, which is again it's rare for me to sit down and watch a movie. And I love I really loved it. I thought was it was no one who no one will save you was good. I haven't watched it. Well, I'm not gonna say it. I have terrible taste in movies, so like I'm not I'm not trustworthy um, when it comes. Oh, to Oh, sure you are. No, 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 no. On YouTube, <laughs> like I like Man in the High Castle show, and I've been told that I'm a, you know, a heathen for loving the Man in the High Castle show. So don't I, tell uh, me. Let me guess. You were told that by PKD fans. Just general people. Uh, I remember at work, I tried to get everyone to watch it. Everyone's like, okay, they never read PKD, and they were like, this show's terrible. And I'm like, I think it's good. <laughs> so it is good. What are they thinking? I also love Stephen King adaptations that are terrible. Um, I'm currently rewatching Rose Red that was on Fox back in like 2001. Oh my, I remember that. That, that was a it's TV not, event. Around in chairs, right? Yeah. What was the name of, uh, oh man, the, the uh, for want of a better word, the male lead, the young male lead. Oh I my can't god, remember his name. I can but... almost remember his name. He's had almost no work. <laughs> the acting's not great. I love it though. I love it, dude. <laughs> no, I can sometimes I can sometimes stomach major Stephen King adaptations for bits and pieces. I don't like think any one? of them are universally effective. I think the most universally effective one from start to finish is the original Salem's Lot. Ooh, but only that is because, a good one. well, you you it's mainly effective because you've got all these great people in it, all you these were, great actors in it. You were on the edge of complimenting Stephen King. Don't lie. <laughs> I'm with had you. I want to stress that it's not great 
okay, all right, fine. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, but it's a Stephen King from 50 years ago. Well, you know. And it's a Stephen King things. telling the one story that he had in him. <laughs> so, so I guess I don't lose much by complimenting it. Sure. A small, the idea of a small town, a small rural town that has to, that is inflicted with vampires. That's kind of interesting. That, that has a dynamic on its own. That, that's kind of interesting. It's different from Dracula attacking London. It's, it's, that it has a, a potential of its own, but it was swamped with great actors and actresses. They're all over the thing. That yeah. would elevate anything. Yeah, I um, Same thing I, as, uh, in needful things. You've got Max Van Cito doing a great job, an absolutely fantastic job. I, the Shining is also very popular. People really enjoy that movie as well. But I know King's not a fan of the adaptation himself. But no, no. Well, you're just hitting the grates, aren't you? Here, you're, 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 you're wanting me to swing on the chandelier from one grip on Stephen King to Stanley Kubrick. You just want me to keep going. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite Stephen King book? Salem's Lot. Okay, so, so unless, unless you count the book that was made of the the teleplay that he did, Storm of the Century, I think that's oh, really yeah. effective too. Until the ending, he can't write an ending to save his life. But uh, but until if you cut out the ending of Storm of the Century, the rest of it is fairly well done. And uh, it's, is it any surprise why I love it? Because it has less Stephen King prose than anything else. It's a screenplay. <laughs> I, show, actually, really I haven't seen the show yet, but I have it queued up after Rose Red. That, that's what I'm going to check now. Until the ending. The ending doesn't make any sense at all. None of King's endings make any sense. They're all, they make sense, but they make sense like a five-year-old would think. You give, give a five-year-old the, the story and ask the five-year-old when he's well into the story, how should this end? And, and he'll, he'll pat the table and say, oh, this should happen. And King thinks that's a great idea. <laughs> He doesn't think, oh, well, that's what a five-year-old would do. He thinks, oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> I'll write a book about a guy who's losing weight steadily. What's a five-year-old say? I bet at the end he floats away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm about to finish Under the Dome. I'm in that last, like, 200 pages of Under the Dome. Good luck with the ending. I've heard it's notoriously bad. Um, and I've, I've enjoyed the book so far. Um, there's things about it. It is mostly enjoyable. Yeah. But, you know, it, it's totally muffed at the ending, so. It's grossly overlong, but it's 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 fairly well it's fairly enjoyable. And talk about adaptations. Have you seen the adaptation? I haven't. I actually haven't seen that one yet. Mm. Bad. Interesting stuff going on there. Okay. Very interesting stuff going on there. Doesn't have anything to do with King. It, it departs from King, and it just becomes a trapped town story. Which, if King hadn't been you know busy just futzing around or doing whatever it is he does when he sits in front of a typewriter, he would have written a trapped town story. But he didn't. <laughs> Name one nice, say one nice thing about Stephen King. Just one nice thing. He gives lots and lots of money to libraries. Oh, well, yeah, that's nice. Lots and lots of it. He gives away money to libraries and literary associations and literary charities like he had none to worry about. He doesn't have any to worry about, but he gives it away freely. He gives it away like water. Hmm. I can't say enough positive about that. That's one positive thing. I'll do you one better because I'm trying to claw back my credit. All right, all right. He has also introduced two generations of people to passionate reading. Yeah, that's a huge thing. That's ja absolutely gigantic. He should. He deserves a statue in Central Park for that alone. I don't. I'm. I don't so much care that he did it with a gigantic river of crap, because they developed reading habits that took them beyond him. A lot of them did. Mm -hmm. I see way too many booktube channels of people just continually re-tearing Stephen King. <laughs> I always want to tell them, you know, there are greener pastures out there, <laughs> but but it doesn't matter. Some reading is better than none at all, and he has made more readers than any other writer in the last hundred years. So, you, so you're a believer of some reading being better than any. That's a that's another place that I would say you split from like Harold Bloom because he notoriously said that people would be better off doing nothing than reading things like Harry Potter or I think he had a pretty low opinion of, of genre fantasy. I know he, there's some books that we could say fantasy that he included in his list and he liked, but for the most part, he didn't really like genre fiction all that much. Yes. Um, and do you know why that is? Cause he didn't read it. Cause he was a snob. Uh, he was a dear, delightful, soft-spoken, playful, funny man, but he was a snob. Terrible, terrible shame. 
I know that a lot of listeners are probably thinking I am, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm not one, I promise. <laughs> yeah, Samoki dude, I know he liked Le Guin and Tolkien. I, he didn't hate all of fantasy, but I think as a when he looked at it as genre fiction, he kind of like you were never going to hear him talking about anything other than like Le Guin and Tolkien, probably. Uh, I know there's a couple older ones pre Tolkien that he also mentioned, but he certainly wouldn't talk about it in public. He certainly wouldn't do that he because he'd lose his dude bro card. Well, and also his snob card. But where does one get a snob card? Can I acquire one? You don't want one. You don't want one. It's such a joyless way to live. Certainly a joyless way to read. But I guarantee you, I know what book utterly inflamed young Harold Bloom. Burst his mind open with a million different rainbow colors. Enchanted him. Almost could be credited with making him fall in love with reading. And it wasn't Ursula Le Guin, <laughs> you know? And it, it wasn't it wasn't any of the highbrow stuff that he talked about. It was The Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Hmm. Wild horses could not have got him to praise that book in front of an audience. But that's the book that did it. So <laughs> it, was, it was The Princess of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs, and it was Prince Valiant in the Sunday comics. Just... Snobs can't stand that. They can't stand giving credit where credit is due. So they, they just don't do it. It's interesting because I feel like, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, there's a big difference between being a professional and then being an amateur reviewing stuff. Uh, but I love talking about formative media for me. Like, I, actually, you mentioned Dragon Ball Z earlier. I say that may be the most formative. Really? Yeah, oh, that I, was a shot in the dark. That's just a coincidence. Oh, I love it. I, I mean, come on. I mean, I, it's a dude bro thing, probably. You could probably throw that in there, right? No. <laughs> no? Believe me, when I think something's dude bro, you'll know. <laughs> but I, I noticed that you very diplomatically moved me away from just continuing to rant on the rings of power. <laughs> probably wise. <lies. laughs> Jared says they pass out the snob cards at Yale. Um, also, um, Arliss Bunny says... No, Steve, I would bet that JKR has made more readers than King. Hmm. Okay. Who who was this? Who said this? Who am I crediting? Uh, this is uh one of my great viewers, Arliss Bunny. I, I you you certainly if there is if there's a pantheon of such people, then Rowling is definitely in that pantheon. The only reason I would give it to, you're absolutely right. Uh, you're absolutely right. And I watched that phenomenon happen. I was actually working in a retail bookstore when that phenomenon was happening. And I know what I was seeing was just incredible. The only reason I would give it to King is because he's done it a lot longer. There, there are people now who are grandparents who, who had a, their love of reading ignited and then kept alive by this author. Mm -hmm. So they've had JK Rowling is just two decades old. Yeah. In decades, we'll be able to tell probably more. Right. Yeah. Right. What, it, and it doesn't have to be an either or. If there's a pantheon, those two are definitely in it. Yeah, uh, certainly. And I, I would say the, the same thing for her. You know, I I would give that to her the same way that if you if you ask me to say positive things about these people, I would certainly do that. I could even go so far with King as to say that he has a pretty good nose for a premise of a book. He has a pretty good nose for that sort of thing. Hmm. He He yeah. looks around the zeitgeist use that you know that that oily old phrase he, he he looks around the zeitgeist and he has a pretty good idea of what will work whether it's you know uh cell phones or um uh, social privacy mm -hmm. in the or or academia he, he has a way of doing that he has a skill at his one skill is that he can look and find a good promising premise. His only problem is that he doesn't then just hire a writer. That's what he should do. He should hire a writer. <laughs> but instead he just writes oh my it. Goodness. <laughs> he has the money. He could hire a writer at that point and say, here's my premise. <laughs> Would you like to uh windmill slam dunk on Philip K. Dick while you're at it? Or do you want to take a break from this well, flaming of authors? I kind of hard to do, didn't you, with your last guest? Who, with Dr. Gregory B. Sadler? What am I supposed to do when you when you pull a dirty move like bringing on somebody that eloquent and that knowledgeable? 
Oh, hey. It really wasn't fair of you at all. He's a great guy, man. I love uh, – if folks, if you didn't see it, I did a stream last night where we talked about – um, the book of changes and how it inspired PKD and the man in the high castle and stuff. And, uh, it's actually one of my favorite discussions. I think I, I, it, it, I should allow me to plug it. You don't have to like Philip K. Dick. You're going to love this conversation. Absolutely. love, it. Absolutely. Love it. The, uh, the, I, I would have done it far more flat footedly. And I would have spent half an hour on the fact that the I Ching does not predict anything. There's no such thing as a supernatural. See, you're already bored. <laughs> so it's lucky that I didn't do <laughs> Well, I think whenever we were talking about it, we were trying to come at it from what PKD saw it as at the time, right? Because I, I also yeah. don't believe it. it's predicting anything at all. And I think PKD came that realization, uh, you know, in later in life. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was super fascinating. And I will say that story behind the book made Man in the High Castle more enjoyable because it wasn't the most enjoyable read. Jer Jared had said that in the comments of the of the discussion last night. And he the exact same experience I had, but I did really enjoy Ubik. Um, so is PKD one of those authors? Like, is there anything from him that you're like, oh, I kind of like this, or is it just like universal disdain? After your last guest, it's a little hard for me to do this. I am just a critic. You had the real thing on last time. Let me just say, let me just retreat to safe territory and say, I don't see any worth in it. Okay. In anything that he wrote. I don't see any worth in it. I think there's more literary quality in the collected works of Edgar Rice Burroughs than the collected works of Philip K. Dick. I'll, I'll preface all of that with a heavily emphasized I think <laughs> because it's pretty tough to call your last guest unknowledgeable. I mean, Gregory B. Sadler is, is an excellent uh, dude. Um, but I do know a lot of people who don't like Philip K. Dick. That This is not one of those authors that I feel like unanimously liked. Um, I I'm not would... sure that it's, that it's healthy either to have him on and then me next. All of your viewers are getting whiplash. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say the, the energies <laughs> are very different. But it's, it's watch, a different watch this episode and they say, Oh, so so Jimmy Nuts, when he has an older guy on as a guest, it's a discussion like this. And then they do in here. It's like fur flying everywhere. Steve, I have plenty of old guys on. Don't worry. <laughs> An arranging amount of topics. All right. So who else do you hate? Uh, let's see. No, I'm just kidding. Going back to the Rings of Power? <laughs> oh, no. uh, here's seen, a question. You haven't no, seen ahead. of the Rings of Power, so you don't know. And and you, you you might be familiar with the Silmarillion. Are you a big Tolkien fan? I like uh, Tolkien quite a bit. I actually have never read the Silmarillion. I've had a uh, story in chunks of it, but I've never sat down and read it cover to cover. It's one of those things I'm kind of like sitting on. Like sometimes I know I'm going to like something, so I wait. Oh, what? You could get hit by a bus tomorrow. Why are you waiting? God, for I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's that sweet great. release. Oh my god. I welcome it. <laughs> that long sleep. Oh man. Well, in the Silmarillion, you will learn how faithful the showrunners of the Rings of Power were to their source material. You will learn whose idea it was to forge the Rings of Power. You will learn whose idea it was that they should be rings instead of, I guess, paperweights. You will learn whose dagger was used with the raw material for the Rings of Power. You'll learn who was vigilant against the creeping evil of Sauron when all, when everyone else was just complacent. Ah, it won't be anything. We don't need to worry. You'll learn who was the one person who was vigilant. You'll learn who the best fighter in Middle Earth is. You'll learn all of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll learn all of that when you watch the Rings of Power. When you watch the whole thing, you'll learn all of that. And it won't be a learning burden because it turns out it's just the same person. <laughs> so, <laughs> also, why? Does Sauron retreat to Mordor and become the Lord of Evil? Why does he do that? What's his motivation? Is it really complex and multi-layered, a factor of envying the elves but also hating them and also envying and hating his departed master? No. No, it's that that one character turned him down for a date. He's hey, an angry it's, elf. It's, it, hey, it's hard out here, man. It's... <laughs> <laughs> so Steve, I would say you're an opinionated guy. Um, I think you would, I think you would agree with that. Um, have you ever changed your mind after writing a review before? Oh yes. Can you yeah. think of like a time always, that stands out? 
I always hope that it that it doesn't happen after writing a review because you can't take back the review, you know, and I, I have a readership. So I always hope that a drastic change of ideas of, of reaction to a book won't happen after I've committed to a review because then the review is just sitting out there. But w when it comes to reading a book and maybe offering, you know, a spoken review or spoken opinions, that happens. Yeah. Uh, Alan Moore, Jerusalem. His I just saw someone reading that today and I was like, I kind of want to check that out. The perfect example. I, I didn't know what to make of it when I read it the first time, hmm. and I, I, or rather, I didn't know what to make of it. I thought, I, I thought this is just the crapulent musings of an old man <laughs> that he is stitching together, but only barely. Uh, and I let time go. I thought, all right, well, that was a misfire. I've liked some of his writing for comics, but that was a misfire. Let it go read it years later and saw everything that he was doing in it that I just plain missed the first time. I'm hmm. glad that I didn't write a long excoriation of it as a review. That would have been pretty bad. The, usually, usually the change of mind with a written review comes because my estimation goes up instead of down or okay. you know, it's radically changed. It just, it just goes up. Like uh, William Volman's two volume nonfiction, the carbon ideologies, which I, I moved heaven and earth to get an editor to let me review the first volume and then the second one the next year or whatever when it came out. I moved heaven and earth to get on record with both of those. And I, I praised them. I thought they were great, but I did not realize how great they were until I went at them again. So, th you know, that would be, I, I wouldn't have much to apologize for in that review. I just, I, I would just be saying, I didn't estimate how much was going on here. I didn't, I didn't get it all because you know, they're two 800 page volumes. You've got a deadline. You can't scoop up every last nuance when that's true, <laughs> I guess. So there's hope for stoner is what you're telling me. No, <laughs> no, Come on. No. I encountered Come on. stoner at the beginning. I encountered it before there were dude bros. When the dude bros, when their, their parents were little babies. I when he was slammed as a journeyman uh, prose guy, right? It's, it's no, it's not journeyman prose. It's well, just, that's what that's what was in the papers at the time when he published it. People, they were like, eh. eh. There was only one critic at the time who uh, actually noticed what I noticed, who, who said, who, who zeroed in on the things that I didn't like about it. That this is this is you know, uh, J. Walter Mitty. This is this is a, a fantasy story about a frustrated suburban worker and it's aimed to be that way it's not honest it's not it's not an honest excavation of the frustrations of the gelded male suburban office worker you can find the the honest versions of those in cheever but this is not that this was aimed to be that you can't aim at that and still be honest it was one review at the, at the time we don't have to circle back to stoner though we got plenty of other things to eviscerate oh my and we haven't even we haven't even touched the surface of adaptations. You were you were just barely starting to talk about adaptations. That's a fascinating thing. Considering how many movies are adaptations these days, they're they're almost all adaptations of one kind or another. They're almost all working off material that's not original to the director. Yeah, and I will say uh, Amazon seems to be the ones kind of leading that charge. Like, for instance, Man the High Castle was actually one of their first shows. And if you look at their original lineup, all, a lot of them were adaptations of books. Uh, and then obviously they've done comics, too, with the boys uh, and whatnot. And I think they did Invincible as well, I think. Um, yeah, it's all it's all the rage now. You go you go to the original IP and adapt that. Half the movies that I've seen recently are or more than half. Are, are drawn from someone else's material. You just, you haul in a director to bring it to the screen, but that director doesn't need, the writer only needs to adapt somebody else's stuff. Yeah. And then the, you know, the vision behind it, I, I think, uh, you know, Dune, Dune was uh, adapted and Dune 2 is coming. I thought was excellent. Did you, did you see it? I did. Oh, I've also seen Dune 2. <laughs> I have a friend who, who sends me screeners, electronic screeners of, of stuff. I, the Dune 2 screener that I have is not complete. There's a whole lot of finished stuff that's not on there, but I've seen all the acting uh, for the one that keeps getting pushed back. And I wonder why it keeps getting pushed back. Like, that's hard to figure out. <laughs> but I did see the original, yes. And I had very little positive to say about it. Why is that? 
it isn't good. God damn it. <laughs> God damn it. Good. <laughs> what is there that's good about it? Oh, good you didn't about? like the score? You didn't even like the score? You didn't like what Zimmer did? No, I didn't. No, I didn't at all. Oh, you know what the score was? The score was Zimmer laying down on a piano keyboard, full length <laughs> on a piano keyboard, and then occasionally scratching his own back. That's the hey, there were bagpipes in there, sir. Well, I don't know what I don't know what kind of physical shape he's in. <laughs> you could manufacture that any kind of way. But you name a single detail, honestly. Name a single detail that wasn't insulting your intelligence. I mean, do we need Baron Vladimir Harkonnen to to float in the air and bathe in crap for us to know that he's a villain? Do we really need that? Do we need that telegraphed? No, we don't. Especially if you've got a great actor to do it. You don't need to do that. The only reason you do that is if you don't trust your reader or your viewer in this case. Or the Benny Gesserit. What do the Benny Gesserit do in Dune's Magisterium, in Frank Herbert's Magisterium? What do they do? They mainly line up brood mares for, for influential people in order to further their breeding line, right? They're constantly feeding women to imperial houses to fine tune their breeding line to achieve the Kwisatz Haderach. If you're doing that as a secret organization, does it make sense that all of your women have veils? No, it doesn't make sense. It's just a cool detail. That's all. It had it was Villeneuve saying, Well, my viewers are stupid. And I need to designate these people somehow. Now, that old director, he shaved the Benny Jesuit bald. I don't need to do that, but I need to do something. I mean, these babies can't follow it otherwise. <laughs> So, uh, should, or, should or, I ask, did, did you like the book? Did you like the book? The oh, I loved it. Absolutely okay. loved it. Okay. But, uh, Thufir Hawat is supposed to be a living computer. And in the movie, how do we know that? You got a great, the best actor in the movie is the guy who played Thufir Hawat. Do, do we trust that? No. <laughs> no, we don't trust that. Instead, let's have his eyes go up in his head when he's Catholic. <laughs> utterly ridiculous. Just utterly ridiculous. It's high school film class stuff. Where the, the thing that high school film students don't get is that they have to trust their audience. Well, this guy was commanding what? Half a million dollars. Half a billion dollars in a budget. He still doesn't trust his audience. I did say that I had bad taste in movies, to be fair. <laughs> Well, you're not alone when it comes to loving that movie. I mean, God, even the cinematography, even the choreography. So so Duncan Idaho is fighting for his life, and we think he's dead, and then we get this, this classic, stupid, stereotypical rising up behind his foes who don't see that he's there. Good Lord, how many times have we seen that film, that scene, rising up when you think he's dead? For Pete's sakes, Bugs Bunny was parodying that in the 1950s. <laughs> And here, this guy thinks it's the greatest thing since sliced cheese. <laughs> well, so I haven't seen that yet, so for me, it was brand new. <sighs> Steve, I love nothing more. Like when I go to the movie theater, I go, I hope this movie treats me like I am so stupid that I can barely. Why? Why would you want that? Because why? I'm dumb. Oh. That, that's why. I, that's why I love Dune because I'm dumb. <sighs> it's it's my favorite thing. I'm struggling to intake air into my mouth and nose. And I'm like, if only this narrative could be spoon fed to me, like they should give me a hat with the dialogue and I'll run it through my nose. The I'm dumb, uh, false confession there would, would have a lot more legs to it. If I hadn't seen that previous episode of the fantasy network, you held your own quite well. I read a script. <laughs> he gave it to me. He's a very giving man. <laughs> No, it's just uh, the all I kept thinking throughout the whole thing is how easy it would have been to fix this. There isn't a way to fix Rings of Power. You, that first season, you just need to torch the negatives and start over. The story of Numenor is a great story to tell, but you can't do it with Kara Zor-El from Krypton as the main character. You can't do that. You, you, you. I know. The directive came down from on high. The directive came from people who actually outranked the guy who bought the rights. The, the movie money people said, this thing, you can do it, fine. We'll give you more money than Uruguay has to do it. It's got to have hobbits and it's got to have wizards. Well, you're in the wrong age of Middle Earth, if that's true. Plain and simple. You can either have hobbits and wizards or you can be faithful to Tolkien. You can't be both. 
and the decision was made. <laughs> what you need to do is fire those people and erase those decisions and just tell the story of the subordination of Numenor, right? It's, it's, it's a great story. But it's never going to happen. It's like, clear. there's no way they're going to do that. There was money for it. Well, what there is. But... Oh, my God. What a story where the captive who comes to the island warps it. That's what he wanted all along was to get close to the king so he could warp it. But you have good people fighting, too. What a story. But no. No. <laughs> no. So you're going to check out season two when it comes out. I no, no, I'm not. I'm not even going to hate watch it. I'm not. I'm not going to pay any attention to it at all. That's actually probably. I, hope, I hope that a lot of other people do too. I hope. I, I hate to say this. It sounds very, very petty, but I hope it completely fails. The first season completely failed. It lost money hand over fist. It lost seventy percent of its viewership right around the same time you quit. Yeah. And Amazon went Ooh. into desperate damage control to hide that fact from the general public, just desperately falsifying things, lying about things, hiding the fact that this was failing. Yeah. I hope the same thing happens. I know the showrunners have not learned their lesson. I know they have not. And see, this is a good argument against not having your favorite works adapted. <laughs> well, <laughs> because now, whenever you mention bad. it in the, in the future, no one I bring it up to be as bad as it was. No one did. No, that's no one I think this one, I think people thought it would be competent. Yeah. Yeah. And that it would have a cast of more than one person. I think a lot of people thought that as well. Or that the one, if there was a cast of only one person, the one person would be an elf, as is portrayed in the Silmarillion. There are no elves in the Silmarillion who are invulnerable to lava. <laughs> Whereas our main character in Galadriel in the Rings of Power is struck full on at full speed by a pyroclastic flow and her hair isn't even lost. So there's no drama. Where is the drama? If this person is invulnerable, if this person can, can only be affected by kryptonite, and there's no kryptonite in Middle Earth, then where's the drama? Yeah. Yeah, it feels yeah, like it, it feels was like a bit hard, hard to, uh, to uh, capture, all, capture all, that. all that. But we could talk about other adaptations. Are you interested in seeing Killers of the Flower Moon? I am actually. I I've am never read the book, the book, though. I'm hearing myself I'm hearing talk. Myself it, from, it, your from your laptop. You are? Yeah, just take yeah, down just a little bit. Thing. I, I have what's the Very strange. Very strange. Oh my. We don't want that. Just turn down just, just, just a little bit. Me? Mm -hmm. How's that? Is that uh, better? Uh, I can kind of hear it still, but I think it's fine. Goodness gracious. I don't know why. Wow. But sometimes it happens. But either way, have, I've never read the book. Are you a fan of the book? The book was okay. It was all right. The, the movie has... I, I, I've watched the movie a couple of times now, just trying really hard to understand what the dude bros love about this just boring average director. And I don't I don't understand it. I, I, I know they're coming out of the woodwork to praise this thing because everyone is saying... You know, this is Scorsese's last movie. Why they think that, I have no idea. But they, they, everyone's saying that. I don't believe it. But I'm always interested in what Robert De Niro does. Always. Uh, I, I don't think you ever quite get the same performance out of him two times in a row. And, and it doesn't matter who the director is. It doesn't matter what the material is. He's always trying to do his just his own thing. And because he's Robert De Niro, you can't tell him not to. Mm -hmm. You can't say the thing you're doing now conflicts with the thing I want to know. Plus, I get the impression that on set, he's probably a real team player. On set, he, I get the impression that he probably has very few Gene Hackman prima donna moments where I don't think he thinks he's bigger than the game. So you, you really get him to subsume himself in the role, which is great. Um, yeah. The uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the... There's one standout. De Niro's really good in the movie. Less said about Leonardo DiCaprio, the better. But De, De Niro's really good. But there's one other. Who's the name of the young actor? Oh, my God. He steals the movie. Uh, I'll never remember his name. He was in uh, Breaking Bad. He was one of the, the memorable guy, yeah, guys. He, he was in Fargo as well. I can't remember his yes. name. Yeah. Uh, he, he steals the movie. If this doesn't make him a name, a name recognition, I don't remember his name. But if this doesn't make him a name recognition star, I don't know what will. Because uh, he's terrific. 
absolutely he's, terrific. Yeah, he's been in a couple of things and has done really well, I think. Um, I, I, I'll probably watch the movie, and then if I enjoy it, I'll probably read the book just because it hasn't been on my list um, for ever. So I feel like I could probably watch the movie. and do, or right. is that Actually, favorite, I, I, I mostly watch screeners. I don't go to movie theaters. Do you? Do you go to movie theaters? Uh, not as much as I used to. I went and saw Oppenheimer, which I enjoyed. And then I saw Talk to Me by uh, A24. It's a horror movie. I, I really liked it as well. Um, but I didn't feel like I needed to see A24 in a theater. I kind of regretted going because there was a lot of kids. And I was like, wow. oh, this is miserable. Like, I forgot how you, miserable this is. You have a big home movie thing, huge TV, that sort no, of thing? No. No. no, I mean, I have a nice TV, but it's not anything to remark about, I don't think. Kills of the Flower Moon. There you go. That's adapted. Uh, my, the favorite screener that I've been watching over and over again, I've probably watched it 20 times now, is Godzilla Minus One, which I don't think is out yet. Uh, but it is it is the best Godzilla movie ever in the whole wide world. I just really? love it so much. Oh, my God. It's so good. It's just so good. But that's an adaptation as well. Yeah. Uh, same thing with... Uh, I have an, I have another screener that has very it's it's just the acting it's just the the stuff that's already nailed down the post stuff and all of the finishing touches uh, the new Aquaman movie I forget what it's called Kingdom of the Sea or Lost Kingdom or something like that uh, that also is based on that the writers just had to you know adapt they didn't have to do anything original yeah. Is there is there any movie or I'm sorry, is there any sci-fi or fantasy series or books that you would like to see adapted that you think would work? Oh yeah, tons and tons. If they're adapted well, <laughs> right? You know, we're, we're, we're not gonna, gonna be adapted well, yeah. If they're adapted well, sure, there are tons of them. Including some fairly major products that have never been done. That I, I really don't understand why we're pouring money into some of the things I'm seeing and not into some name recognition stuff. Maybe it's just that the people who, who scour the world for original products don't know the name recognition. They're not readers. Could very well be. Uh, Dragon Rider Supreme. Hmm. We'd love to see that adapted. I think it would be incredible. The, the visual effects alone of, of wheeling, teleporting giant dragons, breathing fire and thread that comes out of the sky. You'd have to change a bit of it. And in this case, I would want you to change a bit of it. There's a little bit of weird stuff in that, sexually. The, 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 I mean, the, the main story is a kitchen scullery maid who turns out to have an amazing ability to, to telepathically communicate with the giant dragons who are the only defense against this corrosive spore that periodically falls out of the sky. She has an amazing ability to telepathically communicate with the queen dragon. And the queen is the greatest of all the dragons, but then the, the dragons are then ranked after that. And the bronzes are the best male dragons. And they also are telepathically linked with men. And there's a little bit too much spillover of that into the female character's relationship with the male main character. I would want to change that. I think mean, you would obviously have to change that. Yeah. Uh, but the story itself, oh my. What? The basic story? You could make a great screenplay out of it. Because the thread fall doesn't happen regularly. So when we open Dragonflight, the first book, the people of the planet have long since forgotten that they need dragon riders. They've long since forgotten normal precautions. The dragon riders remember, but they're fewer in number. And suddenly thread returns. That That is a great story. If you're dealing with the human element of these, these local lords who no longer want to pay tithes to dragon riders when they don't see the need. They've long since forgotten the need. And you've got this existential threat as well. That would be terrific. Also, George R.R. R. Martin. You see King Baratheon behind you there. And George R.R. R. Martin did co-wrote a book called Windhaven. With Lisa uh, Tuttle, right? Yeah. yeah. A really good story. A generational story about a world of islands. you know, And the flyers who, who are everything between those islands. There's no other way to communicate. So the thieves are too dangerous so these these gliders have to make these perilous journeys you could do wonders with that just wonders with that i've uh, and of course the... there's elric it'd be great if elric were adapted i don't think it could ever happen but it would be great if it did why, why don't you think it could happen you would have rights groups coming out of the woodwork it is it is heavily implied well, that I've the only... element of Elric's ambivalent nature towards evil is the fact that he's an albino. 
<laughs> well, you couldn't do that. <laughs> You'd have rights groups coming out of the woodwork. I, uh, I've only read the first novel, Elric, I'm not a like only that I, I'm still reading through the rest of them. Um, but I, I could see what you're saying. I, I do. When I read the book, I did think that I was like, this would be amazing even as a movie. Like I could see just that story being a great movie. Yeah. I don't know that I'd want any of these things to be movies. I think I would, I would want them all to be TV? cable multi. I think that that has the most potential. It's often squandered. But it has the most potential, I think, to, to just let the thing breathe, to let it sprawl. That that'd be wonderful. But Elric is, you know, a, an absolute bastion of fantasy that has never been adapted. Yeah. Dragon Rise of Pern, at least the first three books, sold like crazy. They were they were a big hit. They bought their author an island. They've never been adapted. And there are plenty of other things. Plenty of things that, you know, I would love to see. There's never been, for instance, to go to go way back, there's never been an adaptation of The Demolished Man by Alfred Bester. I think it could be a really good adaptation. Uh, probably the more science fictiony thing of his would be uh, The Star's My Destination. But The Demolished Man would work really well, too. Then there's some stuff that I just don't think could be, like Book of the New Sun, I think would be a difficult to near impossible adaptation because of the unreliable narrator portion of it. What do you think? Yeah, I've only read the first uh, book and I'm almost done with the second now, but just reading it, I'm like, I don't see how this could ever. The only reason I hesitate is because I would love to see what some really talented director of photography could do with the visuals. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that. But you're right. Uh, Severian would be tough. I there are all sorts of clever ways that you could do it. There yeah. are all sorts of clever ways that you even you wouldn't even have to tell the viewer that he's an unreliable narrator. You could show it to them with the, the photography. Hmm. If you trust your audience, but if you don't, <laughs> then no. <laughs> for me, I, I I I'd be lost. I need them to just laser it into my eyes for me so I can follow. <laughs> you that. I think you'd be just fine. I think you'd be just fine. I I don't know. I you're probably right. I would I would not probably want to see someone try that. I would probably probably I would regret it if they did. But there are all sorts of other things. The closer you get to space opera, the more uh, potential there is for adaptation. Mm -hmm. I was talking with, uh, for instance, Jared Henderson. I was talking with him uh, just recently about the instrumentality of Mankind Stories by Cordwain or Smith. They would be fantastic. Some of them would be fantastic uh, to be adapted. You could make a great story out of Norstralia, his, his novel. You could make a great story out of that. You could make some, uh, some great stories out of uh, a lot of just science fiction stories. Especially if you had the money to do it and you weren't burning a billion dollars on the adventures of Galadriel. <laughs> All that wasted capital. <laughs> One of the only screeners that I've watched recently that was not adapted from, as far as I can tell, from any original material really annoyed me. <laughs> it's, a movie, it's a movie that's coming out, I think, next month called After Death. About ND and near-death experiences and what comes afterwards. It's, it's maddening. Absolutely mad. <laughs> but the one screener I don't have that I really want is Craven. I haven't heard of it. It's a, it's, uh, it's a, a Marvel adaptation of a Spider-Man supervillain called Craven the Hunter. But it looks to me from just the limited. I've seen the trailer. There's a teaser trailer. It looks to me. I mean, it's not. It's not a villain show in which the hero shows up at the end to save the day. It looks like it's a study of Craven the Hunter. And it stars, I, I can't quite remember his name. He played Quicksilver in the Avengers until he was, until the character was shot dead. I can't remember his name. Uh, he can be good. And I, the rumor is that he campaigned like crazy for the part of Craven. Uh, I would love to see that. I haven't got, I haven't got the screener for it. I would love to see that. I'd love, I would also love a screener for the new Deadpool. And I haven't got that either. It's, the nerve of some people. <laughs> I know, right? It's, it's unbelievable. I um, I find the one thing when I when I stumbled upon your channel, I was watching, and I realized that you're a professional critic. I thought it was interesting that you were on BookTube, um, because yeah, I know there are a lot of, there's a lot of people in the industry that they don't they don't want to mingle with us amateurs over here. Um, no, I what, can't believe it. I get I get that still from what, from well, other critics. What made you join? Like what made you come to BookTube as well? It looked like fun. Isn't it fun? 
It's the funnest thing in the world. <laughs> it looked like fun. Hmm. It has turned out to be fun. It is just a pure positive. I, I don't. I don't really understand it myself. Uh, there's. I have a suspicion that I know <laughs> part of the reason why. <laughs> no names, mind you, and and no venom either. Uh, but <laughs> one suspicion of mine as to why other critics don't do this is because I get the impression that a lot of other critics work in books and then they punch the time clock, put their hat on and go home. Oh, okay. And I don't, I work and play. I eat, sleep and breathe books. There's a million things to talk about. I don't do book reviews on book two. I have places yeah, to do book reviews. I, I don't, I don't do book reviews. Instead, there's a million other things to talk about. Maybe that has something to do with it, or Momo. Well, probably it's snobbery. Probably, probably it's just the you know the the dinosaur medium of print newspapers really brings out the snobs in a lot of people. They, they look at that and think, "Well, that's real." And I have to fight against that myself because I I came up in that world. Mm -hmm. I I that was my first world. So I'm still I still reflexively think it, it, your work isn't real unless it's in a print newspaper that comes off on your fingers. That's not true. But I, I still effectively think that. There are booktubers who reach 10 times the number of people with their recommendations on a video yeah. than the most successful critic in the world. I, I, don't, I don't get it. I don't understand the, the blinkers that are in place there. It's, there you, it's even true in the publishing world. I've lost track of how many publishers I've had to tell, I've had to make them aware that there's this whole community on YouTube that talks about books lost off. I've had to make them aware of that. They didn't know it it's when it's their job to know. Yeah. I don't get it. And, and now, I mean, I, I, at least it from bookstores, it kind of feels like book talk is definitely starting to like, they're aware that book talk is selling books. Right. Um, which I always feel kind of slighted because I'm like, they did, they skipped the book tube tables. They just went right to book talk and yeah. uh, that's upsetting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's great for the authors. You know, oh, definitely. You, yeah. you wake up on a Tuesday morning and you're you've got a million dollars in the bank that you didn't have on Monday night. That's yeah. that's great for the authors, but it's content free. That is, it isn't the stuff that's on book talk, on book talk. Most of the stuff mm -hmm. that I've seen is content free. It's just the the wave that it's creating is just biddable people wanting to catch a wave of excitement There's, because they haven't heard anything evaluative about the books. They're just I know you're excited because I can see you dancing around in your apartment. So I want that excitement. I will go and get this thing. I'd be interested to see in a year if somebody were to do a study of how much satisfaction actually resulted from that. I'd, I'd be interested to see that. I bet it's precious little. Uh, but yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't know if there's a harm in that. I, th I think um, there's something nice about being a part of that excitement. It was just, yeah, there's. If it, if it has any chance of getting anybody to read anything, then there's no harm in it. Yeah. No, not at all. I don't mean to sound snobbish myself. It's But how am I not going to stand up for substantial reviewing? <laughs> it's my job. It's what I do. So, uh, you know, the last thing, I, when I look at Book Talk, where somebody's holding up a book and saying, or or a lot of Book Talk videos that have made their authors, the authors, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, just consists of a young person holding up the book while they're crying. Not even any words. Just, just. <laughs> Just that. Just <laughs> I'm holding up this book and I'm crying. I and did that with Stoner. People are pre-ordering it on Amazon. Yeah, I did that with Stoner on my book talk. Just make I, up. In my own defense, I can say Stoner has often brought me to tears. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have a book talk. I do not have a TikTok account actually. Uh, so I, I, I was being an unreliable narrator to you. I apologize. <laughs> um, <laughs> I um. I guess the one pessimistic way you could look at it is that like all that excitement and money is going to someone who may, uh, you know, it could be going to someone who's been trying to cut their teeth for like 10 years and been working really hard and are writing really nice stuff. And, you know, I guess that would be one pessimistic way of looking at it, but I, I kind of agree with you. I think it's like the doorway of getting like more people either back into reading or reading for the first time. And then like slowly finding your way to, to, yeah. to new stuff. Yeah. I don't, I don't know how many repeat customers book talk has. But books, books get repeat customers. Books were the very first thing in all of human civilization to get repeat customers. So, so I, that them I trust. I trust books to to make their own way once you give them any kind of a chance. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but it is odd what you say that the, that the the world seems to have skipped over the middle section, the booktube section, where we've got people of all kinds and varieties. When I started on booktube, there was no variety. Yeah. Now there's all kinds of varieties of people talking passionately at length about all kinds of things, backstock, new stuff. A million different voices. It seems to me that if you were in book publicity, this would be the audience you would want. Yeah. Instead of trying agree. to, you know, catch a craze in a bottle. But uh, no, it's it, it almost never happens. In all the time that I've been in BookTube, no publicist has ever contacted me because of BookTube. About anything. Mm. <laughs> I've never, never been approached for a sponsorship. No one's ever said, hey, can I send you my book so you can show it on your channel? Nothing like that. And I've had friends of mine tell me, well, you know, that's not that's not that big a deal because you're better known as a critic than you are as a booktuber. But you'd think after all this time, it would have happened. Do you think they're slightly afraid that you're going to, um, you know, <laughs> eviscerate it? Like, <laughs> maybe... <laughs> You don't even have to put it into words after this live stream. I mean, you're a beacon of positivity. So I, I mean, I scoff to think of someone not wanting to send their their precious art to you. But do you think that well, might I don't have know. anything it, to do with it? It might have to do with terms and conditions. Certainly, I see a lot of booktubers who fall for the uh, in exchange for an honest review ruse, where you know someone sends you a book and says, "Well, I, I'll, I'll send you a copy of my book in exchange for an honest review." which is pure three card Monty. It's, it's just pure, you know, hide the bean under the cup. You are meant to be distracted by the honest review part because you're an ethical person. So you, the part you're supposed to pay attention to is, well, of course my review will be honest. When the key thing is the review. <laughs> you're, you're conditioning to give a review. That's the key thing. The honest part is meant to distract you from the fact that you are offering to review the book. And that's what I hate about it, because it's so obviously intentionally deceptive to do that sort of thing. Can, can you explain a little further? I'm not sure if I understand. In, in Any author will tell you, especially any indie or self-published author, will tell you that the whole name of the game is getting reviews. Right. Getting someone to notice your book is the whole name of the game. You work on it forever. You pay an editor and a designer and a cover artist. You let it out into the world, and it sinks like a stone. Because mm -hmm. there are a thousand other books that came out on that same day. Right. The whole name of the game is to get people to talk about it, get people to know about it. That's why people spend so much time building booktube communities so that they'll have a built-in audience when they launch their book. Uh, and the people who are doing this sort of three-card Monty know that. They want to build in. They want to guarantee the review. And the, they don't trust to, to sending a book to someone and saying, if you want, if you read this and you like it, I'd love it if you would review it. I see. They don't trust that. Instead, they want to say, well, how about you agree to review it, provided you're honest. <laughs> I got you. Okay, okay. And, I see, I see well, what you're saying. The thing now. they really want is, that, is the lead they're burying, which is that they want the review. Right. Okay. I got what you, I got what you're saying now. I, I was, I was mixing up with, uh, the blame being on the reviewer. I, I I wasn't sure which side you were on. I was just being dense. My the, apologies. The booktube reviewers ought to ought to rate their audiences higher than that. If you can put a book in front of a thousand people, then you shouldn't have to jump through the hoop of saying, "Yeah, I, I promise to be honest." <laughs> Instead, you should be you should be setting the terms. If someone approaches you, you should say, "Well, if someone approaches you and said, I, I'd love to send you my book for you to feature it on your channel," your response should always be, "Sorry, I I don't." I don't do reviews on condition. You send me your book and then I'll see. If I like it, if I have something to say about it, then I'll review it. And if I don't, then I won't. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to hear from you again. I'm not going to give you any updates. I'm not going to be your best friend. You send me your review the way you would you the way you would send it to the New York Times. You send it to me blind. You don't know what I'll do if I'll do anything. And the reason it's worth the postage is because if I do something with it, I'm doing it in front of a thousand people. That's worth the gamble. That's worth three dollars to send a book. Yeah, and maybe having the confidence that you feel, you know, as if it would be well received by the person. You know, you put all that work you, into you it. You have to hope. If you don't have that confidence, for God's sake, what are you doing writing your book in the first place? You have to hope that 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 will happen. It's just way too many authors. They don't they don't leave it at that. They they try to sort of build in a review into the whole process.
Yeah. And the the fault it partly is on the reviewers because everybody on BookTube should have uh, should value their own their own power higher than that. No one on BookTube should ever take that deal. <laughs> is what I'm saying. No one on BookTube should ever say, "Well, I'll I'll review your book, sure, and I'll be honest about it." Yeah. Just because it's free in the mail. That no. <laughs> so no. I don't. I don't do a lot of arcs uh, or review copies almost ever, but, uh, and Alan said this here and I, this has kind of been my experience. That's why I was like kind of confused because I've always, they've it's always been kind of like send a book. If you could get to it, like I've actually had good experiences this way. Um, okay. it, it, there's oh, Alan is saying that that's most of the time. Yeah. Okay. And I know he does. That would be really too. great. The, the things that always stick in my mind are the times when it's not that if, if most of the time it's the author taking that kind of a human approach, that's wonderful. Yeah. Cause that's what it should be. Mm -hmm. But I hear I hear way too many booktubers of all types, not just fantasy novels, but all oh, types. Yeah. I hear way too many booktubers saying, you know, I agreed to review this, uh, to give it an honest review. I agreed to take the book in exchange for an honest review. That phrase just gets my hackles up. So if if most authors don't do that, that's wonderful. Certainly, I deal with a lot of indie and self-published authors off booktube who don't get that. Yeah. <laughs> they, they don't understand it at all. They, they think, you know, here... I'd, I'd be happy to send you a free copy of my ebook. Oh, that's great. You're not going to charge me for your ebook. That's wonderful. In exchange for a review. Sorry. I don't know if I'll review it until I read it. Well, okay. I guess I can live with that. Here's my appearance schedule. And if you could run the review at, at the time of release of the book, I have to email people at least once a week and say, I'm a book critic. I could not care less about the publicity effort of your book. I will not participate in it. I will not be part of it. I couldn't care less about your book's release date. You might as well not even share that stuff with me. I'm ignoring it. So, And you're all about the reader. And that's one thing that we definitely agree on is that, that? Like, like, like you're all about the reader, like oh, yes. your reviews and yeah. in your work and everything. And I'm with you. Um, I've always said that like when I started doing book reviews that I wanted to make sure it was about the reader, not about the author. Yeah, see, that's why you're you're a braver soul than I am because you on on the fantasy network on on chatting with nuts you have authors on. Oh yeah, and 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 you know if I read books and I like it, the author, you know of course I'll talk to them and stuff. But I always you know, worry I about that myself. I have done it a few times on my channel, but I always feel leery about it. Usually it's just friends that I do it with. I I I don't know how I feel about that. I get approached by it. Publicists often want to know. You know, would you like to interview the author? They think it's a print interview. I always think, well, you know, get them on camera and I'll, I'll talk to them for 40 minutes. And then I think, eh, what if I don't like the book? Or what if I don't like the next book? That's what a gamble. If, That's a yeah. Gamble. I mean, what um, if I like the person and we chat? I'm, I'm a gregarious person. Your viewers are not going to believe that, but I, I am a chatty, friendly person. What if, what if I connect with the author and we are email buddies for the next year? And then another book comes out and it's not good. Eww. Well, I think if you're going to build a relationship with someone like that, they most likely are going to be the type of person that can handle that sort of thing. Um, for and me, no I've, I've never interviewed someone who I haven't like read their book and enjoyed first. Um, you know, there might be a range of enjoyment to what they do, but like I can at least point to things and be like, I really like this. I really want to know more about this. I want to know why you did it this way. And it's still, that is still for the reader, by the way. That's still oh, yeah. for the reader. Yeah. Well, the um, way you do it, it is. I yeah. try anyways. I mean, do it's definitely you, somewhat selfish uh, as well. But <laughs> White whales out there? Do you have authors you really want that you haven't oh. talked to yet? Oh, I mean, I would I would do horrendous things uh, to interview George R. R. Martin. Like, he would oh, love wow. it. He would love me interviewing because I wouldn't ask him about wins a winner. <laughs> and he would be like, thank God. And I would just ask about tugboats <laughs> and trains. And he would be... He'd be thrilled. I'd ask about New Mexico. I'd be like, George, how's the quesadillas? Like, are they good? Oh my! He would. He would hate, probably actually hate. I wonder me, how you would go about even doing that? Well, he just did uh, one with uh, uh, Dom. Is that? Is that? Oh crap! I always forget. I forget the guy's channel already. I'm sorry. Uh, he's never gonna watch this. What am I apologizing for? Uh, his name's Dom. He has like sixty or seventy thousand subs, and he got an interview with George R. R. Martin, and it was really good. I really enjoyed it, and I was so jealous. <laughs> it's like, oh man, if that could be the one. Would it be fantasy authors that you would that you would go for? Not not anybody else. Mainly fantasy authors. I just really want to interview John Williams about Stoner. Uh, over and over and over. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I do think that there are 
you know, potentially other authors that I'd be interested in, but like, you know, I've read mostly fantasy and I feel like I have a really, I, I, I shouldn't say decent, but I have some grasp on the genre. So I feel comfortable talking about it in it. You seem pretty comfortable talking about Philip K. Dick. Well, I did. I, I read it and I did my research. I still, I still need to read a bunch more of his books. I know you would tell me I don't need to read them, but uh, I'm going to read them. <laughs> I would love to interview Robin Hobb. Uh, Robin Hobb is like probably second to Germ. Uh, for so, me. so the huge figures that I'm thinking of are all the wrong generation. They're not even crossing your mind. Robert Silverberg is still alive. Sammy Delaney is still alive. They're, they're the wrong generation, aren't they? They're not. They're not crossing your Steve, mind. Steve, you know they're not going to be able to turn on the webcam. There is. You got to. You got to be realistic. <laughs> you got to be realistic about these things, man. <laughs> I can manage. Well, know? I knew you could manage. You have a channel, so I was like, he's good to go. Like we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sweet! Alan is friends with John Williams' necromancer. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I uh, I would absolutely love to interview George Railroad Martin though. I think we'd have a have a good time because I would talk to him about Fever Dream and Sand Kings and Night Fly. I would talk Night to him about a lot. Yeah, um, I almost sometimes when I just reflexively think of him, I still think of him as a science fiction author. A lot of people who read him back in the day do feel that way. I mean, Sand Kings. Uh, I read it recently and literally, I mean, I loved it. And I, I recommend it. And I always um, try to temper my excitement just a little bit because like I know people are going to go read this thing. And I try to think about how everyone else is going to interpret the story. Right. It has been almost unanimously. Oh, you, like, like people love it. You, and you I'm can't like, oversell Sand Kings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, you can't. You can't oversell Sand Kings. Absolutely not. Fantastic. There are a few stories like that. There are a few science fiction stories like that that you can't oversell. You, They're, they're going to work no matter what. I could make an anthology of them. I wish I wish I could make an anthology of them. Cordwainer Smith wrote one. Scanners live in vain. You can't oversell. But there are, there are a few others too. Souls by Joanna Russ. Oh, 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 what a story. What an amazing story. Oh. I mean, you have forgotten more books than I'll ever read. So I, uh, I well, should you're give yet. You could get I around to it. Dude, there ain't no way I'm making it to 50. <laughs> also, uh, a story, I always get this wrong. Gordon Dixon wrote, co-wrote a story with somebody else, and I always get the co-writer wrong, and people always call me on it. He wrote, I want to say that it's him. Maybe he's the thing I'm getting wrong. There's a story called Call Him Lord that is great. Hmm. Someone in the chat will, will certainly know who it is. I want to say Gordon Dixon and Keith Lawmer, but I, I could have both of those wrong. Gordon I know Lord I love the story. Dixon. I remember every detail about it, but but I always get that wrong, the attribution of that. Yeah, 19, uh, my eyes are failing me. I think it's 1966, uh, Gordon R. Dixon, short story. Seems very Okay, so no co-writer? It doesn't, it doesn't say it on Wikipedia. Oh, I'm just, that's I probably what I'm getting wrong. I probably always want to, oh no, I know why. Oh my God, right here on the Fantasy Network, I figured out why I always do that wrong. Gordon Dixon wrote a novel with Keith Lommer called Planet Run. And in the back of the mass market paperback of that novel was the story, Call Him Lord, by only Gordon Dixon. Have I got that right, chat? I know that I have. That's where I got it. See, they wrote everyone that learns when they come to the network, you know? E even I, a professional I, critic. I take it from the fact that you were slowly, phonetically pronouncing his name that you have never read Gordon Dixon? That is correct. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I still have a lot... I'll tell you my biggest sin, and you're going to hate me for this, is I haven't read Conan yet. No Conan. No, no Robert Conan. E. Howard. Not yet. Okay. Have you read Fritz Leiber? I have not. No I'm... Crawford and Gray Mouser? No. I'm working on it. What about any Marion Zimmer Bradley? Uh, no, for reasons. Hmm. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> well, aren't these rather, I mean, oh, aren't these rather, are, are these other things that you are saving? Yes. Uh, well, how could you possibly be saving the Silmarillion? Just hearing that you haven't read it makes me want to reread it tonight. Well, I have to make time for stoner rereads weekly. I got him, guys. I got him. I broke Steve. <laughs> Like maybe if Robert E. Howard knew how to write about the suburban male in the middle class, I would be more interested. 
Oh, believe me, that's but he's exactly writing a, what Conan is about. <laughs> he's, he's, writing, exactly he's writing Dude about. Bro. Conan is the original Dude Bro. No, because he meant it. Howard meant it. He had those desires. He felt he was living a slightly effeminate life. He felt that there was mu- something missing from his life. Williams never felt that. He just knew that other people felt that. I feel like you're moving the goalpost. I'm not. Oh, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> See, in wrestling, this is how we did it. You know, the bad guy would do something to the the good guy the whole match. And then at the end, the good guy hits the bad guy with it. In this scenario, you're the bad guy. <laughs> So heels versus baby face. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. That is correct. No, I'm not moving the goalpost. I invented the goalpost. <laughs> this is perfect. It's like complaining to the referee that I'm cheating and the referees, I didn't see it. it not only was Howard not dude bro because he actually meant it, but he was also not dude bro because the ur text of all dude bro literature hadn't happened yet when he was writing his stories. And what is that? Old man in the sea. Oh, do you hate Hemingway? Oh, yes, with a passion. <laughs> yes, he, is, he is the ultimate architect of my hatred of dude, bro. Mainly, the old man in the sea. Okay. What, what is, is it specifically deep. about old man in the sea? Because uh, I tried to read Hemingway, and I'll be honest, I didn't like it. I, I oh, like there's it. hope for you yet. <laughs> I, I want to know. I, want, I mean, I, I can go on about Hemingway at great length. <laughs> but I want to know about that soap screen of Baratheon. Are you a fan of Song of Ice and Fire? I've been trying to avoid this because if you break my heart on this one, then I got to like shut the stream down and then, you know, come to. <laughs> you know, you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love A Song of Ice and Fire. It is my favorite series for sure. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's it's my favorite. Yeah, it's uh, it's the one I've yeah. reread the most. It's the one I've gotten uh, kind of got me. You know, we were talking about the like, gateways, right? Like that was 100% a hundred percent of gateway into more stuff. When I made this channel, it was all about trying to find the next to Song of Ice and Fire. Like that was my idea behind really? the channel. Yeah. And that's why I've stayed, you know, that first year or two, I was predominantly reading fantasy series, not even really standalones, but series. And I've worked backwards from him. So like he, he had took a lot of inspiration from Tad Williams, obviously Tolkien, but then I started reading Zelazny. And then he mentions Gene Wolf. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to read some Gene Wolf. So like I've been following his trail of inspirations and reading those. And that's why I'm still making my way back to more cock. And I've read some of him obviously now, but oh, I'm wow. still, yeah. So I got a long way to go now. Okay. That's going backwards, mm-hmm. but you also mentioned looking for the next, were you yeah. looking for the next backwards or also forwards for forwards mainly Have and you found I- any even likely candidates? Nothing, no. nothing. Nothing that even comes close. I mean, I, I, John Gwynn, for instance, I, so, I mean, John Gwynn. so I, I actually really enjoy John Gwynn. There, there's stuff that I have enjoyed. Um, when recency bias has settled, um, that's whenever I can kind of make a real assessment of it. You know, um, there are things that I have enjoyed immensely that I could not enjoy a song of ice and fire in the same way. Like Malazan is just so much different that they're in the same genre. They're both epic fantasy, but it's just like, I, there are two what about colors. Scott Baker? I I I feel like you're going to tell me I'm a dude, bro. But yeah, I love the second apocalypse. I thought it was fantastic. But you're saying nothing comes close. You're so including that as not coming close. I I still like a song of ice and fire more by a healthy mark. And when you say that you like a song of ice and fire, so I don't mean to make this a Freudian session. No, no, no. no when no, you no. say that you like a, a song of ice and fire, does do you experience what a lot of Martin fans do, where the liking dips? In Feast for Crows? No. No. It's my, it's my favorite book to reread, actually. Is it indeed? It was my it least favorite it's on the first too. one. Yeah, it was my it's least my favorite, favorite on the first read. read as well. And when I reread it, I actually was blown away. I think thematically, Feast for Crows is his best book. Um, and I don't, I, I mean, I have a I have a lot of Song of Ice and Fire opinions, but I actually like his writing more in the final two books as well. Well, when he decamps from all of his normal characters, cuts the knees out of all of his narrative momentum and writes a whole book that way, you are absolutely, re- in a case like that, you are absolutely relying on your skill on the page mm-hmm. because you've taken away all the stuff that you would otherwise rely on. I think that's what makes the book so incredible. Steve, you're making my heart warm right now. Are we Are we having a moment? <laughs> I just, I, always, I ask because so many Martin fans, so many Song of Ice and Fire fans don't like that book. 
Yeah, I mean, I've I've been fighting this good fight. So I run a reread podcast. We do a chapter a week and uh, we we just go through the books rapidly and then we cover the adaptations and stuff when they come out. But um, yeah, I fight this good fight all the time, dude. So you're part of a, a an adaptation podcast and a rereads podcast. Well, Steve those are the same one. Either of those. Those were the same one. But so we, t- Steve, we talk- uh, you don't want to invite me on so I can call everybody stupid. <laughs> <laughs> These are these are uh, very gentle ah. people, Steve. They're very gentle <laughs> people. You know, they they don't they don't want to be rustled too much. Now this crowd, they can handle it. They, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they can't, they can't. Um, it's just like a whole separate entity of uh, business. <laughs> I do it with a friend, and uh, but yeah, that's no, the this show. crowd can handle it. This that's one of the reasons that you you know why do I love BookTube? That's one of the main reasons is that I found by and large exactly the kind of readers that I love, the kind of readers who are completely passionate. While at the same time recognizing that this is the dorkiest passion of them all, and that it's not exactly heart surgery, it's it takes a bit to find readers who can do both of those at the same time, and they're the ones to find. They won't be boring. They will be able to learn new things. It's absolutely they will have a sense of humor. I love I, it. I feel like I love a lot that of I open to change too. <laughs> Because like yeah. we usually look for things to, to love and sometimes you have to like kind of change your perspective to love certain things or as you would call it, moving the goalposts. No, <laughs> no. I, moving the goalposts is not changing perspectives. It, when you move the goalposts, you are cheating yourself. You're only cheating yourself. <laughs> well, cheating and I'm, I was a bit tongue in cheek. I was a bit tongue in cheek, but I'm just saying that like, Sometimes people enjoy things I don't enjoy, and I and I'm I'm very inquisitive about it, and it changes my perspective on it. Um, oh yeah, that, that's, that's, oh, that's the happened. ultimate gift of book two. I've yeah. literally changed my mind on books. In dis- I remember actually a really good example of this, and I was just talking about a friend who just finished it as well, and he's starting to think this way. Uh, I read book seven of the Malazan series, and I did this great discussion, and I, I entered the thing. I said, "Hey, this is my least favorite Malazan book. I still really like it, but it's my least favorite of the bunch." By the end of it, I went, "Ah, this might be this might be Which, my remind me of the title Reaper's Gale." I, oh, oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, that was when I uh, infamous major major tonal experimentation in that really movie. good, well, you, you, really good or or really noticeable anyway, <laughs> really really noticeable that that he's doing tonal things in that that I think come from the same place as Feast for Crows, which is boredom on the part of the author. I think mm-hmm. in both cases, I'd, I'd be willing to bet a Boston cream pie. That that those changes came because the author that was that was when the author started to feel like, am I chained to this corpse forever? Let me let me switch things up just a little here. Hmm. Yeah, almost I, I see that a lot. That you if you if you dig into some fantasy series, you can always spot the moment when the author is thinking, all right, well the mortgage is paid off, and I don't really want to be writing this until I'm ninety, but I am contracted and I have fans. Let me try something different. It's the same but different. Um. Yeah, it. I, I think that was one of the things that jarred me about it a little bit, and I didn't realize how much was in the book until I was done with it. Kind of, I mean, kind of like feast, actually, in in, in many ways. Uh, and I remember by the end of that discussion, I had changed my mind. I was like, "This is not my least favorite of these." Now, my least favorite Malazan book is still something I I really loved because that's that's my feeling of the series. I just really enjoyed my time with it. Um, but yeah, I think that the reason why people join the community is because they love books. And then, you know, you're going to run into people you disagree with. And hopefully once you find some common ground, maybe you can start to pivot and see from their perspective. The disagreements are fun too, because mm-hmm. you're listening to these people when they don't know you're listening to them. They're, they're, mm-hmm. they're in your kitchen while you're chopping vegetables or whatnot. And you get to know them. It's not just that you get to know what they're talking about. You get to know them. What are the kinds of things that this person notices? What are the kinds of things that they really like? You get to register their own surprises because that's what we're doing here on this weird, <laughs> weird subculture of YouTube is that's what we're doing is talking about books. You, If you get to know somebody like that, even if they start to talk about something you have a fire and brimstone disagreement about, you might start to think about it mm-hmm. again. Yeah. Not always. Not, not, <laughs> not always. always. You're not going to think about Stoner tonight, but... I have been giving Philip K. Dick the benefit of the doubt pretty much the whole of his writing career. 
I have been trying with a wide open mind for Stephen King literally the whole of his career. Every single book, every single time, serially disappointed. One mountain of crap after another. Holly, Holly didn't do it for you. No, no, Holly didn't do it for me. No. <laughs> Fit to be read. Thank you for the five spot. That's very generous. Says, Thanks for the entertainment. Great discussion and great yes. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate it, man. Um, it's always super generous of you to stop by and and obviously to do the super chat. So thank you. Oh, um, you have a super chat. Yeah. Every now and then. You're probably very grateful that you don't have the opposite of super chats, right? When people withdraw money from your account. This would do it if that existed. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be in the down votes. I'll I'll see it there. <laughs> Uh, we got a couple, you know, people are throwing out stuff, you know, from back in the day. They were throwing out Jack Vance, uh, which I've read the first Dying Earth and enjoyed it. I need to continue that on um, because I know that uh, I was talking to my friend Bridger and he was telling me how, you know, Gene Wolfe and the Dying Earth, it, there's a connection there. And then there's a side shot of Nif the Lean, which is a very uh, like forgotten about book that's inspired and actually set in some of the Dying Earth that Jack Vance gave his blessing to. And. Um, so I need to get back to that. And then people are mentioning Glenn Cook. And I would love to hear your opinion of Glenn Cook because I love the Black Company. It's terrific. Oh, thank yeah, God. All right. Woo, woo. Okay. <laughs> what would you expect it, me to say? Hey, you're Absolutely. getting some redemption here. All right. Although I still have a million follow-up questions about A Song of Ice and Fire. Oh, like, we I did yeah. not know that it was your fundamental book. That is, oh, it's, that is so fascinating to me. It's uh, it's it's everything. Uh, it is is. My I mean, favorite. my first question would be the dumbest one, which would be why. Do you know why? Can you pinpoint <sighs> why, or is it lost in the emotional connection? I think uh, the emotional connection is probably the reason why it is very difficult for um things to dethrone it. Like with things that are formative are really like I am. I know Dragon Ball Z is not very good. Like I'm aware, like, like, and I love Dragon Ball Z and there are parts that literally to this day, give me tingles down my spine, but like, I'm aware there's way too much filler and there's a lot of trash in it. And some of it's lowbrow. And a lot of the newer stuff is like, eh, I still love it. You know, I've read better manga. I've watched better anime, but it still has but, that, that pull because of the emotional attachment. But it's not just that. That's no, going it's on. not. It's no, it's not. Fire. No. Um, you know, and if you take out all the because I've also met people through that community and this podcast has like been an amazing thing for me. And that that's a whole nother story. But uh, for me, it's the fact that every time I reread it, I not only find new things, but I find new ways to enjoy it. And I was really nervous after reading, you know, a couple hundred other fantasy series, reading the last reading the second apocalypse. And I went back to a reread and I was like, oh, God, oh, no. What if it doesn't hold up? What if it doesn't hold up? And not only did it hold up, but I actually think taking things away from those other series that, that you know malaz in some ways i think made me a better reader reading a song of ice and fire with a different mindset in a different way i was like man this is really good in fact i almost feel like uh george r, r. martin in some ways in, in the way he's referenced in general it, he's almost underrated in some ways because a lot of people throw him up to shock value and that's it like he just does twist and that's it and it's like no there's a lot of skill in the way that he crafts things, especially when you do a chapter by chapter reread and think about it, the way he places characters chapter after chapter is very purposeful and it will carry on themes from scene to scene to scene. And it is really powerful. Like I, 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 I love the series clearly. <laughs> you thought favorite. it was only going to be me bashing Cormac McCarthy. Uh, <laughs> I was okay with the Cormac McCarthy bashing. I, cause, um, I am not under the illusion that people love Cormac McCarthy. I would say most of my audience doesn't like Cormac McCarthy. I just like him a ton. Um, there's a few people, obviously, that enjoy him, but I know more people who dislike Cormac McCarthy than enjoy him. You're saying opinion. you like him but don't love him? Uh, no, I would say I love Blood Meridian and I love Sutri. I loved Sutri. <laughs> hey, back to the Song of Ice and Fire. Ba back to the, the happy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd love to know what you think is, uh, I mean, yes, there's a sentimental element, mm -hmm. but I'd love to know, apart from that, objectively, I'd love to know what you think isn't there in, for instance, uh, John Quinn. Um, so with who's, Quinn... Who's often talked about in, you know, behind the scenes of being someone who could can, who could finish Song of Ice and Fire <laughs> when, when George R. R. Martin has that one extra cheeseburger. <laughs> Uh, Kev, 
Kim said I had to join during the Cormac talk. Don't worry. Uh, our, my guest tonight uh, hates Cormac McCarthy like you do, Kev. So you're you're all you're in good company. Um, and Jose, I see your super chat. I'll get to it after uh, we wrap up this point. But um, you know, I really like John Gwynn series, Faithful in the Fallen. In fact, it was like kind of a breath of fresh air when I read it because I was just getting back into adult fantasy and getting back into reading this stuff, and it was just like full throttle fun, and it had a sense of family and companionship that is is kind of unique to it like i think john gwen and knowing john gwen is that he's a family man he cares about his family he is there for his like, he's just a great guy and you can see that written in his characters like you really feel like these characters are like familiar and, and care about one another and uh i think that's what's special about it but there is a i wouldn't say the world building is is to that level i mean the sense of history in westeros is astounding when I think of Duskendale, I can think of like three historical events that happen in different eras in Duskendale. <laughs> like that is ridiculous. And I know people are going to say it's the War of the Roses. I know, but there's still more than that. Like it, that, what about that's the uh, the sort of long prequel? Oh, um, 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 sorry. It has uh, such a dumb title that I'm blanking on the title. Fire and Blood. Yes. Love Fire and Blood, it. something or other. Fire and Blood, and you know. He wrote a what? fictional history book, and I loved it. I read all 850 pages and loved it. I'm just so in, you know. It's like okay, but a very different kind of love, I bet. Oh yeah, right. for sure. Um, you know, I would say it, it's like an extension of the series, right? Like if he had just written that book, it doesn't, it doesn't work for me. Like I don't think it would work for anybody. Do you agree with the characterization that I've read? Well, maybe you don't. You're not in a position to know. I've heard it characterized as his Silmarillion. Uh, is, in some ways, but I think you it's haven't read the Silmarillion because you're sitting on it. Well, yeah, but I do know that the Silmarillion is vast in what it covers and the different groups of people. Whereas Fire and Blood is really about the Targaryens. It's much more scoped, um, and it's just impressive. He wrote a fictional history book that, in my opinion, was entertaining. I mean, it, it really was, and I was. I was very enthralled by it. And there's a lot of room for interpretation. There's two different accounts of things. And he kind of plays with that. You know, he's obviously a fan of Gene Wolfe. Gene Wolfe does Unreliable Narrator better, I think. But, you know, George gives it a pretty good effort, I think, as well. So. Oh, it sounds like you should interview him. I would love to interview him. Oh, my God. I would. You should have I, him on the Fantasy Network. I bet. Oh, yeah. It. I'll just email him. <laughs> George at tugboat.com. He'll he'll just yeah, send an email to his publicist. They'll bring it up to him the next time they send him batches of emails. Okay, yeah, this guy's name's Jimmy Nuts. And he's gonna go, What? No, I'm gonna watch the Jets lose. That's, well, that's, that's <laughs> no, the way to do it would yes, Jimmy Nuts, yes, but in small print, the big print would be for the major authors who've already been on the fantasy network. Yeah, that's, that's all true. That's all that that's what would work. Maybe that's Chad what put in a good word for him. And Maybe what Chad. fun that would be. Good lord. Oh, I would I would be very excited. I that would be I the what he's like in an interview. I have no idea. So I've watched up almost all of his interviews that are available from like way back whenever he wasn't popular and then to when he is. And I think he's a really great interview. Um, he just you can tell he wants to talk about other things at times, and people ask him the same questions a lot. Uh, the best interview I've ever seen with him is whenever him and Robin Hobbs sat down, they shared a same editor. And the editor interviewed both of them and hearing them compliment one another and like actually know what they were talking about. You could tell they read each other's works uh, hmm. was really cool. I really loved it. Um, we do have a question here from Jose and Jose, thank you for the, the super chat. It's super generous of you. Uh, thank you. And he says, what does Steve think about Malazan as a whole? Well, I, I really uh, snagged on something that you said about how it made you a better reader. I, the, the point the point that I was that I, I was going to reassure you that you need not have worried about my reaction to a song of ice and fire for one main reason apart from how enjoyable it is which is that what you've been talking about that Martin respects the intelligence of the reader there's there's he never does anything like that Duncan Idaho scene in Doom where <laughs> the figure is standing up slowly behind the men who think he's dead he never does anything like that and Good Lord, Erickson is is that on steroids? He yeah. he he's practically lost in his own head. He he it not it's not that he's making a decision to respect the intelligence of his readers. It's that I half the time think he doesn't even know they're there. It's just, <laughs> in, in a good way, in a very yeah. good way. I I 
I think that uh, Malazan is one of the pretty rare example for me, where, in my opinion. I mean, I've read a lot of fantasy, but in my opinion, it's a rare example of where uh, when you're finished with it, the weakest book is obviously the first one, the one that introduced you to the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I think that has to do with just that he got into the telling of it the more the more he did it. Yeah. But it, I mean, in answer, I don't know if that's if that's enough. But in answer to the question, I'm I'm impressed by it. I really like it. I'm not a super fan, but I really like it. Yeah, Gardens of the Moon also had the um, struggle of it being a screenplay originally. So it was a screenplay. Oh, was it really? Yeah, him and oh, uh, his, wow. and his. Uh, uh, Esselmont had worked on it. I believe Esselmont helped work on it. I might get that detail wrong, but they uh, they worked on it as a screenplay and they had pitched it around and they had conversations and stuff. And then they said, well, let's turn this thing into a book. And he turned it into a book. And uh, then he signed oh. one of the most historical deals in Canadian his like publication. But surely none of the other books have that genesis. They don't read no. that book. No, 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 no. But uh, I'm, sh- I'm sure you probably have heard. But if you ha- like, I don't know. You can tell me. But uh, the whole gaming scenario behind it, how the world was actually their tabletop game. Oh no, I didn't know that. Yeah, it was a tabletop game. They threw out the D and D rule set. They tried another one, threw it out, and they just did this like home. They, they would be um, playing with with the characters that you're reading about, and some of the major events actually were dice rolls. <laughs> Isn't that wild? <laughs> Oh my. <laughs> and oh I'm pretty my. sure they gamed while I think Erickson has talked about gaming while he was on archaeological digs because he was an archaeologist. And uh, you know, they'd be hanging out and gaming. Isn't that crazy? Have you ever done that? No, I actually have not. No tabletop gaming. I mean, I've done like one shots in D&D uh, for a work event once and it was uh it was fine. Uh and I'm trying to think I don't think I've ever played D&D otherwise. I don't think so. No. Not that I can, rem- not that I remember clearly. So, have you? I had an abortive one attempt. It's a clear <laughs> story to the viewers of my channel. I, I have never been welcome to play board games because my beagles always ate the pieces, uh, and that happened with the one time that I was I was all set up. I was ready. I was I was told here's what you need to do to build a character. Here's all the, it's, there's a lot of math involved, but we'll help you. You're going to have a lot of fun down the line. And the minute someone threw a polyhedron dice onto the board, one of my boys ate it. And <laughs> the, everything on the table was just horrified. They, it was literally like a Hollywood moment where they all just thought, did that just happen? <laughs> That's our only one. They cost $20. <laughs> did that just happen? And then all hell broke loose. And nobody was satisfied when I said, well, you know, if it's that important to you in three days, I can have it for you. <laughs> Nobody was satisfied with that. <laughs> and that, that is the exact same story that attends to my history with Monopoly or Risk or any other tabletop game is that that always happens. People say, it was always, these were all decades ago, but it, it was always the same reaction. It was people saying, well, I know they seemed unruly, but I, I kind of thought, and I, I would say, no. I don't train them. <laughs> I love them, but I don't train them. I'm sorry <laughs> that, you, that you didn't believe that, but it's true. You threw something in front of them and bounced across a board. Of course he's going to eat it. <laughs> it's his instinct. Well, I uh, I can join you in being a and d list person, I guess. I, I would like to play. I would I would honestly really like to, but you have to have friends for that. So that that's a, that's a blocker <laughs> for me. Well, uh, I could do it now. I have, I have a bossy little miniature schnauzer now who would think that that was that lunging onto a board and eating something was just something a loser would do. She thinks all dogs are losers because they don't have any <laughs> control. So she wouldn't do that. I, I could do it now, but I couldn't do it then. In the golden days of D&D, I tried once and was never invited back. <laughs> Same thing with Monopoly. My boys ate the pieces. They so ironically If I, if I ever host a Monopoly dog. night, I, I will bring you over to Monopoly night. All right. <laughs> and I'll just continuously move the go. Back and forth and back and forth. But, <laughs> My goal for this. One of the things that uh, you left a comment on a, on a, a live stream of mine, I think, in which mm-hmm. you you somewhat testily, it seemed, said that you that the fantasy booktube realm of Gondolin doesn't only read fantasy. Yeah. So if we if we now that we've dealt with Cormac McCarthy and Stoner. 
Are there any other candidates on your own part? Uh, I mean, I really enjoy Leo Tolstoy. That's someone who's who I've gotten to recently that I really enjoyed. Um, I'm still working my way through Anna Karenina. It's such a big book. Um, I'm reading it very, very slowly. But the death of even Ilyich is one of my favorite stories ever, like ever. Um, well, so good. Um, what about uh, Thoreau? You strike me as a Thoreau person. Uh, have you no. just talked to him? No, I just have not. Which one would you recommend I start with? Well, you know, any paperback collection will have it'll have Walden and it'll have a bunch of essays. Okay. Anything like that will be fine. It won't be any one thing. It'll be his register. You strike me as from the stuff you're talking about in fantasy. It strikes me that you will really like him when you get to him. Okay. But who else? Oh, say so Tolstoy. But when it comes to non-fantasy stuff and also non-crap. Well, that's see, that's our problem. Uh, <laughs> that's not our problem, pal. Oh, mine. It's your problem. <laughs> if you, it, I don't. I don't need to rant. <laughs> I don't need to rant. Well, I've read all John Williams' books. I, I did not get through Augustus because I just didn't want to read it at the time. Um, and I know I've read other stuff, but now I feel like I got to pull up my Goodreads because I can't remember it on you the spot. You didn't get but... through Augustus. No. Yeah, and it's. I will one day, but. I had no idea it was back and forth letters or anything. I didn't know anything about it. And I started, I was like, I'm not in the mood for this. I'll come back to this. <laughs> oh my. Oh, when, it, when it comes to uh, fantasy, do you keep a, a mental list of things that you're really waiting for? Um, I have ideas of things that I know that are like a rainy day. Like I call them slump busters. So it's like, all right, I'm in a slump. Like I got to read. No, I mean things that haven't been written yet. Are there authors you watch where you're thinking, I really want your next book? Oh, I'll, I'll... yeah, I would I would I would do, again, dirty things for China Mieville to continue writing in the Bass Lag series. I mean, I I don't understand why he had to abandon and like get all serious. Like I, I want him to come back because I think those books are fantastic. I think the Bass Lag series has some of the best uh, world building. It's so cool. Yeah. It's so different. And, uh, no yeah. one, and uh, you know, I know he writes in a way that might be harder to digest than some of the other stuff, but it's really not that dense to me. I, I, I don't know. I'm a big, big fan of China. Mievel. I'm very excited to see what Ken Liu does next. I really, are like you Ken a big Liu. fan of everything he wrote? Uh, me I've only read bass lag. So okay. I haven't read embassy town. Um, uh, what, what's the rat? There's a rat one, right? I'm trying to remember. Uh, and then yeah, he has nonfiction stuff as well. The city and the city. The City in the City. I, I have them. I just haven't read them yet. I've just read um, the Bass Lag series. But when I finished Iron Council, I was like, why? Why did he stop? And apparently he has no interest uh, in yeah. ever returning. It's a really, sh I think it's a shame. Um, oh, yeah. I did read Boy Pot Parts by Eliza Clark, but I don't think you would probably, you probably think that book was garbage if I had to guess. <laughs> Pure garbage from start okay. to finish. Yeah, I, I garbage that. from uh, that obviously has you can see where it comes from. It comes from a posturing hothouse flower who has never been told a negative word. <laughs> that, that's it's the kind of book that can only come from a place like Steve, that. Steve, you can't ask me to tell you what I've been reading and then say these things. Oh, were you were you naming boy parts as something that you liked? Oh, I loved it. Oh, was, you've got to be kidding me. What about my year of rest and relaxation? You didn't like that either. Hot girl fiction's the rave, Steve. Give it the oh. times, bro. Oh, my God. I'm sensing more goalpost moving. <laughs> You're making me sense goalpost moving. You've been talking for the last half hour about great books that you really like. And now you're telling me that in the, in the same way, without changing the verb like, you're saying that that also applies to what's her name? Stupid Clonophon book. <laughs> My year of rest and relaxation is pure garbage compared to the things you've been talking about liking. I adore a song of ice and fire, but I very much enjoyed my year of rest and relaxation. The ending was a little, eh, but I, I enjoyed the book. I had never really read anything like it at the time. I'm excited to read Lapvona by her. I think it's going to be good. Oh, you should read it. See, Steve, you got to go back to your, your your published works. You can't you can't hang around here with us low lives. 
Oh my, my Kev, Kev Last still, year of you, rest and relaxation. Oh. Have you read Flowers in the Attic? I know you don't like these questions, but he would like to know your thoughts. Oh, all right. Well, it's it's your stream, not mine. I know. Right? This is the only so one I'll do. I, the only one I don't get to erupt like Vesuvius. I should point out Kevin Jenkins that I very much like dislike have you read questions because I read an average of 120 pages an hour for an average of eight hours a day. And I've been doing it for longer than your parents have been alive. So picture your grandparents in the funny hats and the suspenders meeting, courting and deciding to raise a family. That's when I started. <laughs> so have you read questions? Is almost always a bad idea. So have you read it? Yeah, I have. It started a whole subgenre. It sold a million copies. Yeah, I have read it. It stunk. It stunk? You didn't like it? Yeah, it stinks. Trite? Yeah, it's trite. It's overtly manipulative. It's horribly written. Just horribly written. It's it's Ira Levin. Well, you just Levin. run Kev over because he hated prose. it as well. <laughs> but unlike Ira Levin, who is also a crappy prose writer, Ira Levin has these terrific ideas. That you, you know, you don't mind. The, the crappy prose because uh, he's got terrific ideas. A cloned Hitler. <laughs> you know, who, who, who's going to mess that up? Who cares how well that's written? <laughs> you know? it, it, nothing. Flowers in the Attic, none of its, of its spawn have ever had any ideas like that. What What is the idea behind all of that author's books? That families are crap. Well, I agree. Anyone from South Boston is going to know that already. That's old news. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the uh, Tolstoy quote, right? The uh, the famous one everyone quotes every time they talk about Tolstoy. Every, like every time they talk about Tolstoy. Yeah. 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 It and it's quote. wrong. It, it's, it, I, it, I like the quote. It's always quoted. Well, it's a, it's a nifty quote, but it's wrong. It's objectively wrong for our for our the few viewers who have managed to hold on through this bile fest. Tolstoy starts off Anna Karenina saying that all happy families are alike. So that every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. And you know from lived experience, same as I do, that that is not true. And the only reason that Tolstoy didn't know it is because he never met any families. He didn't know any families. So he was just, I guess, I suppose it could be that way. Who knows? <laughs> I, I, I don't want to inject NyQuil into the veins of the viewers, but uh, what, what are your thoughts on Dostoevsky? I love him. Okay. Thoughts on Dostoevsky? I'm a, within reach. <laughs> I'm a, <laughs> here is the Michael Katz translation of Crime and Punishment. Dude, that's actually it is blurbed on the back by James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, Harold Bloom, Bums. and me. <laughs> Wait, you're on the cut. No, I am on the cover of this book. There's Harold Bloom, there's James Joyce, and there's me. <laughs> Why are you talking to me? <laughs> like, why are you? Yes, I love Dostoevsky. Absolutely, I share the cover with uh, your precious Harold Bloom. But James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, Harold Bloom, I beat them all on the paperback because on the but paperback was, I'm on the front cover. But he was on he was a t on top of you there. Yeah, the but I wish I had the paperback within reach. I don't think I do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's because no one cares about the paperback. Oh, but people should care about the paperback more. <laughs> they care about the. Uh, is that because you're on it? I do. Oh my god! How lucky to care. Let's. I'm not just on it. I'm on the front cover. <laughs> that had to be a misprint. There's above no the author, right where I belong. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad and I brought it up. It's because of this that I am actually a TV star. Bet you didn't know that. I did not know this. There was a cable show starring tiny little Penn Badgley called You, about a, a guy who yeah. narrates his own stories. He's a stalker. He's the yeah, villain. He's the bad guy. Yeah. And at one point in the show, he is carrying this paperback. And for a fraction of a fraction of a second, you can see my name <laughs> on an HBO show. Is this why you are the way you are? Could very well be. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Well, Steve, we've been going for a, a little over two hours. I don't want to take up oh, Friday. Good Lord, we have been. Yeah, I know, right? It didn't feel like it. You were just lighting fires left and right, and I was trying to put them out. 
I know, you poor kid. You've I aged mean, 10 years just in this one live stream. <laughs> I will say this, actually, before before we sign off, if, you, if you're if you're okay with me asking this, another question. Um, and, no, I, and I'm, I'm also happy to come back. Oh yeah, and I gotta come over. I gotta come over to your side of the side. Everyone will make fun of me because I like boy parts, but that's okay. I'm I can handle it. Um, I am very curious about uh, how you feel about self published works because again, a lot of the people who are in the more traditional professional world, I've seen dissenting opinions at times, not all, but some. And I know that you are not totally against self pub in any way. Um, I'm hugely in favor of it. You're hugely in favor of it. Oh, I have, absolutely. I think you're going to have an a opinion that would be different than what I've stated in the past. And I'm, I'm kind of curious because I don't think uh, I've solved it in my head. But do you, when you review or critique those books, do you critique them as these are self-published works and then these are traditional as in like on a curve at all? No, no. Oh okay. my God, no. If okay. The minute you impose a curve, you disserve everyone, not just the author, who certainly doesn't want to be estimated on a curve, but especially the reader. Okay. No, no, that, no, no. It's not like it's not like you know you you pay for uh, an indie published book with monopoly money. Right. You're still paying for it with money. You're still your time is still 60, 60 seconds in a, in a, you know in a minute. Yeah. You, you don't get a, a special discount in time because it's an indie book. No, 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 hmm. no curve like at all. None whatsoever. Let me put forth no. why I've, I've said that I have before. And it, it comes down to resources and more people have their hands in it to improve it. An editor, you know what I'm saying? Like, and not every self-published author has the ability to go get a copy of a, or a developmental editor or whatever else. Does that weigh in at all? No, for a couple of reasons. <laughs> okay. One is that no one's got to gun to your head to publish poor work. And two, those people at mainstream publishers never do anything but hurt a book. <laughs> so, so it's not oh. like, you can, it's not like you, can, you can point to them and say, well, you know, if I only had them, this, this wouldn't be quite so dumb. Because they're going to dumb it down. That's their job. No, oh. no, there can't be any hint of a curve. That Self-publishing and indie publishing are having an enormous renaissance. Finally, they have crawled out of the basement of vanity press disdain. People make a living on these things. Very oh, good yeah. living. Yeah. They don't get reviewed in mainstream publications. They don't show up in bookstores, but it doesn't matter. It, it's cut the knees out of the industry because it doesn't matter. You go straight for your own audience. You build your own audience. And you get better at your craft because your audience is with you and helping you. And you make money while you're doing it. Not a lot at first. You don't get the big payout that a publisher does. But you get 80% of whatever payout you do get instead of 10%. No, no, hmm. you, cannot, you cannot betray that renaissance of critical acclaim, of look at the professionalism of the Indian self-published stuff that comes out nowadays. Look at the professionalism. It looks wonderful. Oh, yeah. Some of it's very impressive. Yeah. Totally impressive. You can't cut the knees out from that advance by introducing a curve. These are not the poor cousins. No, no sense of, well, you know, there are, I, I want to cut you a break somehow. Or you, you've got a kid on the way. You, you did a, a, a Kickstarter and talked about your mental health or what. No, absolutely not. You're putting a book out into the world. You're asking for time, attention, and money. You're playing on the exact same field as George R.R. Martin. If I judge you by a sliding curve, ugh. I'm betraying my own art and you should slink off to the basement and write for your own private consumption from now on. If that's the game you want to play, mm. then you don't deserve to be out in public. No, your book is out in public. And you know what? It, the foremost compliment that I can pay that book is to go at it with knives. That's the foremost compliment I can pay it. And if it doesn't survive that, well, then you weren't ready for it out in public. That's not my fault. I, the worst insult I could pay an indie author would it's be to say, film. well, you know, mm. little Timmy, you know, I mean, <laughs> he only had $50. First of all, I'm not going to damn a book because it looks bad. That's not a worry anyway, obviously. If I damn a book that looks bad, I damn half the mainstream books that come across my path. I'm not going to care about that sort of thing. 
but you cannot cry. I only had $50 for an editor, and that's why I missed all these spelling mistakes. You can't do that. No, you can't do that. No one, None, none of the pulp authors who never made spelling mistakes in their lives paid for an editor. No, 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 no hmm. curve at all. But I'm a huge fan of of the, the world of it all. I think it's hugely impressive. I really, really ought to review more of the books. I know that's the lifeblood of what these people do, and I don't do it. That is a holdover from the old new print newspaper days. The, one of the old dinosaur attitudes that I just have not uprooted in myself. That I should. I really should. Yeah. This mainstream dinosaur legacy media does not deal with indie books at all. They, yeah. They don't pay any attention to them whatsoever. For I, me, uh... The Ultimate Cautionary Tale was a great big book that came out probably 15 years ago, something like that, uh, called A Naked Singularity by Sergio de la Pava. And it, it was, he self published it originally, and it was the ugliest thing you have ever seen. It had a blurry blob on the cover. The binding was terrible. I don't think I even got it back from my P.O. box before it started falling apart on me. But it was brilliant. I read it, and it was brilliant. It was easily the best novel I read that year. It, it, just random chance that somebody connected with him sent it to to my journal. Uh, otherwise, I would never have known about it. It wasn't going to be in any bookstores or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And it was fantastic, revelatory and fantastic. And I sang wow. its praises, and so did a bunch of other people once they learned about it. And he got a mainstream publishing deal. He's now a mainstream publishing author. But how many of those are out there? That your random chance has never even made me aware of, or anybody aware of. Yeah. No, 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 I love it. Absolutely love it. I want to try it. I want to join it. I just haven't got around to doing it. That's well, you, you got to make time. Well, I make the time for writing. I just don't get around to the rest of it. It all seems so tedious to me. That's to fair. Figure out what page gutters are. What does that mean? To to figure out, you know, header and footer and. Where are my page numbers going to show up on the text? And yeah, what about do I need an editor and also a proofreader? Do I need a second proofreader? What am I going to pay for a cover design? That sort of thing. All of that stuff that you know, if you're a self published author, you have to do that. You have to do it all. Oh, yeah. And yeah. all of that seems so tedious to me. The beginning parts of it, sure, I get, it. but the rest of it, I really should. I just, I just don't. That's all. That's a it's a skill in itself, all the stuff that surrounds it. It really is. And then the marketing it, it's a completely well. separate skill. It's a separate yeah. skill for the writing. Yep. It, which you know, if you're an author for a mainstream publisher, you can offload that to other people. You never have to worry about it. You will be presented with three covers for your book. Do you have a favorite? Matt says you should just tweet your book out in bits. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's the name of it? What's the name of the Japanese name for novels composed on cell phones? It has a name. There was a whole article about it in the New Yorker that was absolutely fascinating. I uh, I, I am not aware of it. What this means? What what it what does it mean? What will it do to the form of the novel? And the, the, the Japanese, as is their wont, they give names to everything. <laughs> They've got a word for everything in Japanese. <laughs> <laughs> they give a name for these you know these kids in school who aren't paying any attention to their teacher. They're just writing a novel on their phone. <laughs> but i'm i'm not going to do it myself no but boy oh boy i'm going to write a story for nano rival i know exactly what it is oh my i know exactly what it is that's exciting i am oh. uh i'm thrilled to to see how it comes along man especially since it's fantasy um we'll see if you can top you know some of my other favorites like boy parts and my year of rest <laughs> the key when i was thinking about it the key was uh I was fighting because I'm looking at the type, of, the type of thing that I want to write. Not the type of story, but the, the type of, I don't know, themes, atmosphere of the story. I know what I want to write, and it's not fashionable. And the key is just to not pay attention to that. You, not pay attention no, to that yeah. at all. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you just kind of have to write what you want. And that, that by the way, self-pub, like, that's one of the nice things is you don't have to follow trends. Nope. I more gravitate towards self pub that is against the trends or something that you wouldn't see generally and traditionally published. Like that's what I go to self pub for a lot of the times. Like it's the, uh, the motivation to, to go check out, uh, those things. So, uh, I'm with you. I think you should just write it and write it how it came to you and 
you'll do your best and it'll probably be awesome. <laughs> well, <laughs> <laughs> we'll see, right? This is sure a, a lot of fun to do. This is a uh, good one to end on because there's been a lot of debate back and forth, but what, well, you know, we, we, we know what you don't like, but can you name five books that you love? Not don't have to be your favorites, but like just five books you love. Five books that I love. Mm -hmm. Do they have to be fantasy books? No, they could be anything. No. I mean, you're going to win over brownie points if you use fantasy, but. Well, okay. I'm sure we can do fantasy. All right, let's do uh, it. King of Elfland's Daughter. Uh, the Pastel City by M. John Harrison. The City and the City. By Chandra Mieville, I think that is it is a tremendously, tremendously good book. It is incredibly memorable, Ooh. except for the ending. He blows the ending, but everybody blows endings. So <laughs> almost nobody can do an ending correctly. Uh, also, uh, Damiano's Loot by R. A. McAvoy, not known at all. It's historical fantasy, which is rare. That doesn't happen that often. It's 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 fantasy, but it's set in the Italian Renaissance. Hmm. Uh, and is very good. <laughs> it is. It's the first book in a trilogy, and the whole trilogy is really, really good. But the the first book, Damiano's Lute, has wonderful stuff in it. Or Damiano is the first is the first book. Sorry, Damiano's Lute is the third book. Damiano is the first book. He's an apprentice sorcerer, and there are a couple of scenes in there that are what I want to see sorcery as in more books, and I don't see it hmm. too often when I'm reading a fantasy novel, sorcery is a character's pointing their hand and then, you know, superpowers, <laughs> cosmic yeah. rays come out of it. No thought, no care, no cost, no specificity, just energy beams, like in a Marvel comic book. In, in, in Damiano, that nothing, nothing like that happens. Interesting. Uh, and what's another one? Uh, Stallman's book, The Orphan. What, what's it called? The Orphan. The it's Orphan. a... Yeah, it's a werewolf novel, but absolutely tremendous. It's an absolutely tremendous werewolf novel. Is that by Robert Stallman? Yeah, Stallman's book. He he did a few others after that because people really liked The Orphan, but The Orphan is tremendous. Oh, my God. I love the cover. Oh, are you looking at the old Timescape cover? Yeah, it's yeah. cool. I, I, I love these kind of covers, man. So there you go. That was easy. Yeah, and honestly, I only knew one of them. So uh, I know that's not true. I knew two. I knew two of them. Um, so all folks, my favorites are before the fall of Rome. <laughs> so I didn't name any of those, but those are still those are some that I love. Absolutely, well, that, that's perfect. I think it gives people something to uh, to check out and look up, uh, and hey. and it slightly humanizes your monstrous guest. <laughs> As I say, you know what? You were good sport. You were good sport. <laughs> You were you were you, uh, which is what I figured we would get. And uh, I want to say, chat. Hey, thanks for being here, Steve. Thank you for being here and give me some of your time on a Friday night, man. I really do appreciate it. My uh, pleasure. Do you, you want to tell people where they can find you on the internet? Well, I have a booktube channel. You do. Uh, I do. <laughs> I have a booktube channel with more videos, not only than any booktuber has made, but than any single YouTuber has ever made. Uh. And I also have, you know, there's stevedonahue.com. You can you can always go there. Reviews show up there. There's I'm a, there's an online literary journal where I'm I'm one of the founders and one of the editors. Open letters review. There's almost a, there's a new review there almost every day. Uh, not only by me, uh, by a bunch of other people too. Uh, lots of other. <laughs> I, I show up all over the place. I'm the Virginia Creeper. <laughs> I, crawl, I climb up on everything here. But in terms of this video, it's it's booktube. Yeah. And I have his channel linked down in the description below. So if you want to hear more from Steve, who's, you know, very enlightening and very encouraging, by the way, I would say, especially if, if you're someone who aspires to do NaNoWriMo this year, I think it's an excellent channel to check out. Uh, I want you all to join me for NaNoWriMo. I didn't so much want that when I felt like I was just going through the motions. But now that I have lightning running through me, I want you all to feel the same thing. And you got to cast around. You got to try things out, or that won't happen. You're not. You can't expect the first story you think of to cause that. Certainly didn't for me this time around. <laughs> yeah, and that that is the truth. Um, yeah. Thanks for being here, Steve. I appreciate you, man. My this, pleasure. This is a lot of fun chat. Again, thank you. And look, we all came out unscathed. We're all <laughs> we're all still healthy. I hope. Uh, and all, we're all still uh, hopefully having a good Friday night. But, uh, folks. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And hit like on this video, all the YouTube stuff that you guys already know about. Uh, it helps out the channel, yada, yada, yada. But until I see you next time, be good, be safe.
And remember to always keep turning the page.